How do you attend the Latin Mass? What should you wear? How do you prepare your mind and your outlook for it? How do you move through a missal? And what are the structure and the parts of the Latin Mass? I'm joined today with my friend Eric Sammons. We did a video a while back. It was 10 reasons to attend the traditional Latin Mass. It turned into 20. We each gave 10. And surprisingly, we each had 10 different ones, which was awesome. And um, I encourage you to check that one out if you're not convinced why you should go to the Latin Mass. And if you are interested, then this is the video for you because we're going to break it all down. So Eric Sammons is the author of The Old Evangelization, and that's a great book. And uh, welcome back, Eric. Thanks for having me again, Taylor. Okay, so um, since we did that video, 10 Reasons to Attend the Traditional Latin Mass, I received hundreds of emails and tweets and Facebook messages and comments underneath that video saying, okay, I like what you guys are saying, but I'm a little nervous. I'm a little intimidated about making this switch. Um, So can you do a video on it? So here we are. And I think we should begin first with just the outlook. Um, What would you say you need to change in your mind or prepare in your mind, maybe the week before, the night before, before you dive into a whole new liturgical experience, if you've never been before? Yeah, I would say the first thing is relax and don't worry. I, uh, years ago, when I lived in Washington, D.C. area, I made a habit of attending different Catholic churches, a lot of the Eastern Catholic churches there, as well as, and of course, that's when I first started attending the Latin Mass. And it was a great experience. But what I really I noticed I would invite friends sometimes, Catholic friends, to come with me. And a lot of times they turned me down because they were nervous. The idea of walking into a, what, a foreign church and really the Latin Mass to the average Catholic is like a foreign going into a foreign country. And so it's nerve-wracking. It can be nerve-wracking. I mean, it literally speaks a different language. And just like you're nervous if you're going to – maybe you're going for the first time to a foreign country that doesn't speak English, you get nervous – I understand that, and it, it, it's natural, but I would just say you don't have to worry. Although it does seem like a foreign country, you're really, that's your homeland, and you just don't know it yet. And so don't worry. Don't worry about things like, okay, am I going to mess up? What if I wear the wrong thing? What if my kids make too much noise? Uh, you know, think, what, I don't know Latin at all. I couldn't say the first word in Latin. All those things that go through your head, I get it, and I understand that. But don't worry about any of them. It's going to be okay. And really, no, most people probably there, if not everybody, won't even notice that you're a foreigner, so to speak, for the first time there. So I think that's my number one advice is just relax. Don't worry about it. It'll be okay. Yeah. And, you know, being a foreigner, I notice new people all the time. Our our um, fraternity parish has, I've heard, 1,600 on a Sunday. So it's big, but I still notice new people. And I've been, you know, next to... Uh, you know, a, a gentleman or someone who has the the missile that's in the pew open and they're moving the ribbons and they're looking, I just kind of see next to him, you know, and I'll, I'll kind of like show my missile where we're at. Oh, thanks. I'm just so happy to see new people there. Right. I want this to grow. This is why we're making the video. I want this to grow. So, you know, if you see some, it's like if you're a professional soccer player and you see new people on the field and, you know, maybe their footwork isn't right, you're not, you know, condemning them. You're just glad there's new people in the sport. Absolutely. So. And I, I see that all the time where you, you get somebody who shows up and they don't know what to do uh, with their missile. And inevitably somebody near them just kind of quietly just kind of shows them maybe points in, sure. in the right page or something like that. I've even had somebody in front of me before who I could tell was just hopelessly lost and getting a little frustrated. And I just kind of lean forward and I just kind of point to the, and kind of show them mine and say, okay, just, just look here. I remember one time I went to a a Byzantine Catholic church and it was the first Sunday of orthodoxy, which they walk around, they do a procession around the parish with holding icons. It's a very awesome experience. But as soon as we walked in, they knew we were visitors. It was a very small parish. They knew we were visitors. And immediately somebody came up to me and and started to explain what they were going to do because they knew how odd that might be. And I think you get that experience. People at the Latin Mass, they know it's different from the norm. It's sh- obviously it should be the norm, but it's different from the norm now. And they're always every inevitably they're very open to saying, OK, we're, we're going to help you out. And nobody's going to look at you funny like, oh, my gosh, you shouldn't be here. Like you said, the exact opposite. They're they're ecstatic that you are there and they want they want you to feel comfortable. 
That's right. And I, I would also encourage them, you know, to realize it's not that hard. Don't I mean, you're going to feel confused, but after three or four times, you're going to know where you're at. After a year, you're definitely going to know. I mean, my wife's yeah. never taken a Latin course in the world. She always knows exactly where we're at. I mean, how many adults could take a piece of paper that has English on one side and a totally unknown language on the other side and be able to follow what was going on? I'm, I'm assuming 99% of adults would be able to do that. So this is, we're not asking you to do like something impossible. Right. And it's and, not Japanese. I mean, Latin right. very, I mean, you know, English has a lot of its basis in Latin. So there's tons of words that you see that in, and you hear in Latin that you're like, I know what that means. And, right. you know, when you hear credo, it's like immediately like, oh, I know what that means. And, and things creed, like yeah. that is very, uh, it, so it's not, yeah, it's foreign, but it's very related already to the, the language we have. Now, a lot of these words that even a uh, typical Catholic who's never gone to Latin mass, you hear Latin words various times. In yeah. just regular mass and, and other places in, in the church, you just hear it, you know, names of encyclicals, things like that. Right. I mean, if you hear, I mean, Kyrie eleison is Greek, it's not Latin, but if you hear chanting Kyrie eleison, you're like, oh, I'm in the Kyrie, Lord have mercy. If you hear Gloria and Excelsis, you know you're in the Gloria, right? Be honest, uh, yeah. If you hear Oremos, let us pray, you're like, okay, we're maybe moving into the collect here. I mean, there's cues. I mean, honestly, we should make like a list of like 20 Latin words. If you just knew these 20 Latin words, right. you probably know exactly where you are in the mass at all times. Yeah, because if you get lost and all of a sudden you hear the honest day, you're like, okay, I know where we are now. Yeah, we're I mean, at the Lamb of God. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah I mean, so my, I it, my yeah, 10 year old is following all this. Yeah, my, my nine year old has really gotten into more following along what's going on. And uh, I, I, it's exactly what I did when I, I was teaching her and my seven year old. And just to have them understand where we are, that's exactly what I did. I did certain parts of the mass. I said, when you hear this, you know we're here. When you hear this, you know to say this. Uh, you know, so Dominus Obiscum, you know what to say. You know, if, if it's a mass where you, you respond, obviously we're not talking about the low mass or something like that, which we can talk about in a minute later. But the point is, you'll know at least what's going on at these various times. And so just key words like that, how the creed begins, things like that, all kind of just orient you at the beginning. And like you said, kids, I mean, it, it's it, trust me, if a seven year old kid can do it, you can do it, too. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think both of us agreed in the last video that for the first time or even the second or third time, we would encourage you don't use a missile. Right. Don't use a book. Don't use anything. Use your eyes. Right. Watch everything going on. You know, you'll see you'll see things maybe you've never seen before. You know, like a, a priest, a deacon, and a subdeacon in a solemn high mass. You know, you you might see the Asperges for the first time where they go up and down the aisle at the beginning and and spray everybody with holy water. Um, you might see a proper sensing of the altar for the first time at an offertory, you know, there's going to be all kinds of things that are going to be happening there. So we, I, you still agree with that, Eric? Yes, definitely. I think I would definitely say don't use a missile the first couple times, just experience it. Then you can graduate to a missile. And at first you'll probably follow the missile along like every single word and anything like that. And what will happen is after a certain amount of time, you'll have your missile with you, but you'll only use it for certain times of the mass, like the readings or something like that you actually don't follow along as much as you used to. And I think the key, one key difference between the new mass and the Latin mass is the form of communication is much deeper and richer in the Latin mass. What I mean by that is the primary form of communication in the new mass is uh, vocal. The, the priest doesn't do that much different. They mostly just stand there a lot. And so if you went to a mass, for example, in Germany, the new mass, you don't know German, you would get lost very easily because the priest doesn't really do very much with his hands, with his movements, with the prayer, all that. At a Latin mass, actually, you can follow along a lot better because it's not all vocal. And so the fact that you're not hearing your vocally, your, your vernacular language, do, isn't as much of a disadvantage as you might think, because you can know what's going on. You could be, you could be deaf and you could know what's going on at all times in the, in the, in the Latin mass. The new mass, it would take a little bit, it would be a little more difficult to know that. And so I really think just following along without a missile, to get back to that, is 
you can do it because you're seeing all these actions that the priest is taking and you're saying, okay, he's doing this now. I know because his, his, you know, his body, the way he's holding his hands, all these different things are different where he's moved. Like for example, just one example, which we'll get probably into in a minute is how the reading of the epistle is on one side of the altar, the reading of the gospels on another side of the altar. So, you know, immediately he's reading the epistle now because he's on the right uh, from, from the congregation, the right side of the altar. Oh, he's reading the gospel now. And of course, the, and the candles being brought over to the gospel. Whereas, you know, New Mass, sometimes they do that, but rarely, usually the priest just goes up with the deacon and they don't have the candles there at where they're reading, at the ambo or anything like that. So those type of things, I think, really can help you start. If you're, if you're thinking of that more, using your eyes more, not, not being like, okay, I have to follow every word, but more just like, oh, I see what's going on now. He, he's, going, he's standing over here. That means he's doing this. He's standing over here. He's, he's got you know, the, the sensor. He's doing the incense. Those type of things, I think, really help you follow along without necessarily knowing a word that's being said. Yeah, that's a good point. I've never, I've never realized that, but as you're saying it, I'm thinking this is true. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking if someone took photos of different parts of the Mass throughout it and showed it to us who've attended the Latin Mass, I would know from the photo what part of the Mass it is and what's likely being said. Right. Whereas from a Nova's Ordo, the photos you wouldn't know. He's over standing by the chair or sitting on the chair. So um, that's a really good point. And it's something intuitive. I think that you're right. At first, you're just following, you know, okay, he sent Kyrie eleison, Kyrie eleison. Right, but after yeah. a while, you, you you kind of know all, you know that already, what's going on. Right. And you're right. I pretty much, I pull out my my missile. We'll get to the missile in just a minute. Um, but for the epistle and the and the gradual and the gospel, but usually, you know, I have children in the pew with me and right. and there's other things going on. So, you know, the offertory, like yesterday, um, I was at mass by myself and I just kind of did a refresher and I went through the entire mass and all the set, you know, all the prayers, secret, communion, post-communion. I went, did the whole thing, you know, right. line item. Just, just kind of wanted to refresh, you know, and I didn't have the kids with me and it's just kind of good to get back into it. But Sunday to Sunday, I rarely get to do that. Right. It's a matter of like, you know, heads down, head up. At first, I would definitely recommend head up. Yes. Because you're experiencing everything you're looking. After a while doing that, and I, it's each person is different, but maybe after a few times, you might become more heads down. And that's OK, too, because now you're the missile. You really want to understand what, what are the prayers that are being said? What do they mean? Because once you see that, you're going to be blown away. And then you follow along. And then after gradually, usually a few months, in my experience, is you become more heads up. And you're now, you're experiencing it because you know the creed is being said. And you know what the creed says. It's, you know, if you've gone to, if you're assuming you're a Catholic who's gone to the new mass, you know what the creed says. So you don't have to follow every Latin word of the creed. If you know the creed's being said, you know what it's saying. And frankly, you'll pick up half the words anyway, just because they're so similar. We, we've used them. English words are based on them and things like that. So I think that's kind of the evolution of the development of going to the Latin mass over time as you go from heads up to heads down to back to heads up. And like you said, I do the same thing when I, every once in a while, when I go, when I'm at a daily mass by myself, uh, Latin mass, I will, I will, sometimes be completely heads down because I kind of want to refresh myself to remember exactly everything going on. And, and I think that's a good thing to do. But usually when I go, I, I, I just go to the missile for the readings and that's about it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So it's, um, it's the day before night before, and you're going to go by yourself or maybe you and your spouse or you and your spouse and the kids. Um, I think one of the, the most common questions that I've gotten in the last month or so is, uh, what do I wear? And for the guys, it's, do I wear a suit and a tie? And for the women, it's, do I have to wear a chapel veil? I'm, I don't have one. Do I need to wear a hat? I mean, they've just seen pictures or things from the 1950s or they remember what their mom right. or their grandmother did. And they're thinking, I don't own that. You know, so, right. some of these men have, they're 45 years old. They've been to mass every Sunday since they were a baby and they've never worn a tie to mass. Right. It's not been the custom since the 1960s. So they're a little bit nervous about, you know, usually they'd wear a, some jeans and a polo. Right. And I think the key is, the first thing to note is, there is no rule in the sense you're going to get kicked out or judged harshly 
if you show up in a different, in not wearing what everybody else is. I, I, for years, I lived in Florida and we went to a, a fraternity parish there, traditional Latin mass. And it was about two miles from the, the number one beach in America and Siesta Key in Sarasota. And so sometimes you get people show up in shorts and flip flops because they're just like they're, they're in town visiting. They're Catholic. They see a sign Catholic Church. So they show up. Nobody's like, oh, my gosh, these people, they're terrible. It's like what we said before. Usually we think, oh, they're visitors. Hey, let's make sure they kind of know what's going on. So that's yeah. the first thing is it's not like you're going to be kicked down or anything like that. But at the same time, the Latin mass does have more built in reverence into it. And that reverence spills over into the congregation. You're going to want to dress up. I mean, that's what I think happens is I found that I don't really do this anymore, but for for a while, I got casual when this was years ago when I regularly went to just a, a regular English Novus Ordo Mass. I got more casual in my dress, and I think it was a subconscious thing. I started wearing just polos. I never wore jeans because I grew up Protestant. Oh, my gosh. I think my dad and my mom would kill me if they if he ever heard I went, went to church in jeans. Um, but but the point is, is you know, I even got more casual. And then I, I started – when my kids started getting older, I realized that kind of was an instigator to me. Like I need to dress up more because I need them to know how important it is, what's going on. But I think in general, just going like mass, you'll just start to want to dress up more. So, yes, I, I personally, I always wear a jacket and a tie uh, at the Sunday mass, uh, no matter what. And my wife always wears a, you know, I actually don't pay attention to what she wears. I think she wears a dress every week. Who knows? Um, <laughs> but, you know, the kids, I make sure the kids dress up. You know, they're always, but like, you know, my son, um, he serves most of the time now, so it doesn't really apply to him. But when he's not serving, you know, he often, has, he's 15, he often has a tie on or at least always has dress pants on and a dress shirt at the very least. And, and I, that's kind of our minimum. But I think in general, you will, you will want to dress nicer than you might normally, but don't freak out about it. And now, and then the veil is the one I know is a big one for women. And I get that most Latin parishes I've been to, they have veils available, like in a little basket when you walk into church so you can get it. But if you feel like that's going to completely distract you and you're just going to be so freaked out about it and subconscious, you don't have to. Don't feel like you have to. There, there will be other women there likely who aren't as well. It's an optional thing. My experience is most women do who regular attenders do wear it. But it, it, again, don't make that like, because if you're sitting there at mass, your first time going to Latin mass, and all you're thinking about is everybody's looking at my head right now and whether I have a veil, you need to take a step back and realize don't that, that's not the essential yeah. here. The essential right. isn't what, what's on your head at this point? Yeah, I, I would tell, you know, I, I try to wear, you know, a, a sports coat or a suit. Sometimes I wear a tie. Sometimes I don't, um, depending on on the weather or just what's going on. Um, and like my kids, I try to, you know, uh, a dress shirt or a polo shirt and no jeans, slacks. Um, and we get some pushback on it, but I, I push back. And then, <laughs> um, you know, but at, at our Latin Mass... You know, I've seen people in shorts and T-shirts. I've seen people in, I've seen women wearing a sweatsuit. I've seen, uh, I've seen everything. It doesn't, doesn't matter. I'm just glad they're there, you know? Yeah, I exactly. greet them and, at coffee hour and talk to them. And I've never experienced anyone questioning someone else's garb at mass. Right. So I would say uh, dress so that you're not self-aware. Right? right. So if you're going to go to your first Latin mass, like, well, I usually just wear shorts and a T-shirt and you're going to be paranoid about that. I would say, well, put on, you have a pair of slacks and a polo, put on a pair of slacks and a sl polo right. and, and and go. No one's going to notice you. Um, yeah. Because you so, want to um, disappear, I know. I mean, that's usually what happens. Yeah, I mean, if you're get, wearing torn up jeans and a Motley Crue tank top, <laughs> you're really going to stick out, you know? Right, right, yeah. <laughs> so, so maybe don't wear that. But, you know, you shouldn't be wearing that anywhere. Um, so, uh, so yeah, okay, so we've we've covered the, the clothing. We've covered the missile. You know, for those who do attend the Latin Mass, I, I've i started to Saturday night or even the morning before to go through the propers for the Sunday. I just, just because I know that when I have kids with me. And, you know, I've studied years and years of Latin. So, you know. It's a little bit easier for me. I realize not everyone's going to do that. So, you know, I can pretty much hear the epistle and the gospel in the Latin and I'm 
I'm comprehending it, but I still, sometimes there's parts of it that I miss or phrases, or I don't quite hear the priest right. I'm not quite sure. I always know what the gospel reading is because it's the gospel and you've heard these stories. So I like to look at them ahead of time and read them, know them. And then when I re- really do hear them a few hours later, the next morning, like it's clear. Right. But and again, that's, those, yeah. that's advanced. Like you don't have to but, do that, but I think especially if you have children and you're not going to be able to keep all of your, your ribbons straight and know exactly where you're at. Cause kids are kids, you know? And then like yeah, with the veil, my wife usually wears the veil. Sometimes it's in the other car, you know, or it's not in her purse, but you know, when we have little ones, they're constantly pulling the veil off and down. And you see that a lot with women with kids. Right. The veil will just kind of eventually just be kind of on the back of the neck. <laughs> yeah. That's okay. Yeah. Everybody thinks that's cute and, and it's, it's fine. You know I mean? And it's great because it means there's kids there. Right. Exactly. And if your mass isn't crying, it's dying. So, <laughs> and so I think, okay. So that's the, that's the prep. Right. Do you have something right. else you want to add there? I was just going to say for those who I'm terrible at languages and my Latin is terrible. I mean, I've, I've, I, I follow along. I know the basics as much as possible, but I'm always been terrible at that. For those who are like me, what I often do before mass is I will read the English of the propers beforehand. So I know what is going to be said, what's being prayed, things like that. And that way I'll hear it in Latin. I don't need to feel like I have to look at the translation. I can more just experience and, and hear Latin and I'll know in my head, okay, generally I know what he's praying for now and what he's saying and things like that. So even if you don't know Latin, you can read the English ahead of time if you want to, if you don't want to, because I tend to not like, and I've been, since I've gone for, I tend not to, to not like trying to follow in English while he's praying the Latin. I just have a hard time with that myself. So I prefer to like read it ahead of time. And that mm-hmm. way I just know um, kind of what's being prayed ahead of time. Yeah. Good. Okay. So let's start with the mass. You get there. Actually, we should probably, you get there. It's, you know, it's a, it's a big deal uh, traditionally not to be late for mass. And uh, I've, I've not always been good on that, especially with the large family and trying to find the missing shoe in the backyard, you know, of the four-year-old and all that kind of thing. But you don't want to be late. Um, you'll notice when you get there that no one's talking or hanging out. Right. It's quiet. And that, that's kind of your first shock when you get there. So when you get there and you see your buddy, you don't be like, Hey, what's up? You know, you know, shot an 81 on the course yesterday. That's, you know, that doesn't happen. It's very quiet. Lots of people, lots of people are kneeling and praying. And so when you sit down in your pew is very likely the person behind you is still kneeling. So the whole thing about like sitting, not sitting back and and hitting them (laughs) in the, in the face or something like that, you know, things like that. I mean, obviously that happens in the new mass as well. And different parishes have different levels of that, but it's much more common that somebody will be kneeling the entire time before mass begins. Uh, they will get in their pew. They will, you don't have to, of course. I right. have like a terrible back, and so often I can't kneel for a long period of time, so I usually don't. But just know that there might be people kneeling the entire time before mass and praying, um, and so you just have to be aware of that. And your little kids be aware of that as well, of course. Right, right. Yeah, I. you come in, and you, you always genuinely, because the tabernacle will be front and center, always. And uh, I usually go into the pew... I kneel and just greet our Lord in the tabernacle. And then maybe I'll open the missile and say some other prayers or I'll, I'll sit down and just kind of keep my eyes on the kids. Right. And if it's your first time, I would recommend you sit about midway to three fourths of the way back. Don't be right. You don't have to be all the way in the back or anything like that. Cause then you might not be able to, depending on how big the church is, you might right. not really be able to see what's going on. But if you're about midway back, what you, what that helps you do is you don't feel some con- subconscious that everybody's like looking at you because you're in the front. But also, and this is a this is always my key that I did when I, whenever I go to a, a new uh, liturgical tradition for the first time, is I often once the, the mass begins, the liturgy begins, I will find somebody up closer who is obviously know what they're doing. And just kind of every once in a while cue on them to know when to stand and sit. Because here's something people might not know who don't go. Oftentimes people who go to the Latin Mass even regularly don't know when to sit, stand, or kneel. They're just looking at people around them too. So if you don't know, don't worry about it. But you kind of can cue on the guy. Yeah, find a pro. Yeah, find a pro who knows when to stand and sit and things like that. 
And maybe one day you'll be the one sitting in the upper third of the church and you'll be the pro that other people are looking at because you'll know, okay, I stand now, I kneel now or whatever. It just kind of helps you. Obviously, everybody will eventually do it. But I've been, I don't know about you, but I've definitely, especially when it's a, a special mass where you'll have half the congregation standing up and half them sitting down because they're confused about what's going on. I mean, the, the, the normal yeah, Sunday mass people know, mm-hmm. but... And don't worry. So the, the point is, be relaxed about that. Don't worry about it. But if you find somebody up front who kind of knows what they're doing, that, that'll help you as well. Yeah. You know, I just realized we forgot something, and that is high mass, sung mass, low mass. So there's the solemn high mass. This is ideally you want to go to this one, in my opinion, the first time. I think you agreed last time, Eric. You, this has a priest, and he's flanked by a deacon. And by a subdeacon on his left and his right, and those are his wingmen. The whole mass, they're they're moving and working together. It's really beautiful, and uh, they'll be wearing a dalmatic and a tunical. Priests will be wearing a chasuble. Um, it's a little more complicated in Holy Week, but always that's how it works. And that is, you know, there's going to be just beautiful Gregorian chant. You might hear some polyphony. You're going to see incense. You're going to see holy water. You're going to see lots of altar boys. It's really the best. It's the most glorious. And if you're like, you know, Eric was saying heads down, heads up. I think if your first mass is going to be heads up, not heads down, you want to go where there's the most to watch, right? the most movement, the most pageantry. And so the solemn high mass, if where you're going offers that on a Sunday, Adjust your schedule and go to that one. Also, if you're bringing kids, they will be blown away yeah. by Mesmerized. the Psalm High Mass. Yeah. Because there's so much to watch. So if you go to a low mass, that's the opposite end of the spectrum. It's very quiet. Uh, I think, um, didn't you say, Eric, that the first time you went to a low mass, you didn't even know it started? Yeah. And I got starting in, late. I really, yeah, 10 minutes in, the priest had started. I was sitting pretty far back. I didn't even know that the mass had started to low mass because he just went up there. He's saying these silent prayers and everything. And I had no idea that it had begun. I just thought people were kneeling to pray or something like that. So, yeah. So yeah, the, the <laughs> low mass has no music, no chanting, uh, no incense, no asper, no holy water. Uh, it's, it's very quiet and right. um, it's, it's beautiful it's, in its own way. But it, that's it, right. It, it's it, an acquired it, taste. It takes a little bit more time to get into it. Um, and then there's kind of the hybrid, which is called a Misa Cantata, a sung mass, which has the music and the incense and the holy water, uh, with the priest, you know, going around. Um, but without the, the deacon and the subdeacon and the, a few other minor differences. So if you get a chance, for your first time, your first few times, go to a sung mass or a solemn high mass, often called high mass or solemn high mass. And, yeah. And so the, a couple of things to know is most parishes will say in the bulletin ahead of time what type of mass it is. So if you're wondering, like, how do I know? Usually it will say low mass. If it's a low mass, it'll say low mass. If it's a high mass or it might call it a high mass, a sung mass or a missa cantata. And if it has the word solemn before it, that means it's the highest one you can do without a bishop, which, and so that would be the three, you know, the the priest, the deacon, the subdeacon. Another trick is when you walk into the church, look how many candles are lit on the altar. If two candles are lit, it's a low mass. If six candles are lit, then it is a, either a high mass or a solemn high mass. And so that's how you know as well, once you get there by how many candles, if you're a little bit confused, yeah. you'll know soon enough if there's no chanting and no saying it's, it's a low mass. Uh, so really as far as the experience is the first time, yeah, going to a Psalm high mass or a high mass, i.e. sung mass is the best to start with just for the experience of it. Uh, but to learn the details of kind of what's going on, if you have a parish that offers like a daily low mass, which a low mass, a daily mass will almost always be a low mass. That's a great one to go to. Because now you're really getting to the nitty gritty because you, you really see the kind of the, the, the structure of what's going on and, and the basic, the essential prayers and things like that. So right. it's kind of, they, they serve different purposes for that. But there's no, anybody can walk into a solemn high mass and immediately say, this is beautiful, unless there's somebody who's like, you know, possessed or something like that. I mean, it, you don't have to be Catholic or anything. You, I mean, that's what they show on movies and things like that because right. it's so beautiful. 
a low mass, though, because of how our culture and the church culture and everything has changed over the past 50 years or so, the low mass is much more disorienting because even Catholics, I think, have kind of the Joel Osteen view of what worship should be, that it's supposed to be entertainment. And there's mm-hmm. nothing entertaining about the low mass. If we're honest, the sung mass to a non-Catholic can be considered entertaining. I, I hate that word because it's not really what its purpose is. Right. But for somebody who is completely not Catholic and just watching it, they could, I mean, the music is so beautiful and, you know, the, the incense and everything and the, and the visual, what you see is so beautiful. A, a non-Catholic could consider it maybe even entertaining and, and, and captivating, I guess is a better word. Whereas the low mass, yeah, that's not the case. I mean, you, you barely hear anything the priest says. You don't necessarily know what he's doing. And so to our modern age, that is, that's weird. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Which I, you know, I went yesterday low mass and rather liked it. Mm -hmm. I like the, you know, there's, it's, again, it's acquired taste. I've always said the Latin mass is like beer. The first time you have it, you may like it or you may not like it, but after you've had it four or five times, you love it or whiskey or, you know, however you want the analogy. But the, the low mass is like hoppy beer. You know, it, it's a it's a it's even more acquired taste. And um, I love it. I, I prefer, of course, the solemn high or pontifical solemn high. I take that every day if I could get it. But but I also appreciate the low. So, boy, OK, so we've done almost half an hour of only we haven't even got into the mass yet. So um, I have a missile with me. I don't know if you have one with you. I have a couple. Probably. And the first, I just wanted to bring up, a lot of parishes have this one. Most yes. people just call it the red missile. Mm-hmm. I highly recommend that for first timers and people who are new don't have right. a missile because most people don't have a missile already. Right. And most, like I said, most parishes have it available in the pews or in the back or something like that. And this is definitely the best one because you see it's very small, it, very big print and everything. It has everything. It has things on the side to explain what's going on, what the prayers mean, has the pictures, has the Latin on one side, the English on the other. And it tells you, the best thing is it tells you when to sit and stand and kneel. I mean, it has it right there on yep. the side, what you're supposed to do. So this is definitely, and like I said, it's just called the red, everybody calls it the red missile. I don't even know. I've never that. been to a Latin mass anywhere in the world, well, or in America, where I haven't seen that red missile. Right. So grab one. I mean, like I said, the first couple of times I would say don't even bother grabbing one. But once you say you want a missile with you, just grab this one. And yeah. it's perfect. It, it's yeah, perfect before you do it. get buy one of these, you know, right. a big one, yeah. which has every single thing for the whole year. That's that's the training wheels. Right. It's and, it's, and, it's, and I used it for years. And my kids, yep. that's what I would have them use. And. Uh, there's nothing wrong with, I mean, it's great. It's perfect. Right. And then I'll, Eric, I, I'm, then just, I'm, I'm thinking it. of this. Yeah. That's the big one. I'm thinking of this. This is so cool. This is like training, yeah. you know, like worship is not just like, ah, go in, you know, this is, this takes some serious effort. I love I mean, it. Is it worth you it know? or not? Yeah. Is it worth it or not? I mean, the fact right. that you actually do have to be trained for this tells you it's something worth doing when you get right. a new job. If it's a job at McDonald's where it takes you five minutes to get trained, well, you know, the job's not the same as maybe a CEO of a corporation where you need to know a lot of stuff to do the job successfully. Right. Same thing with worship. Yeah, you can show up at the local Pentecostal or whatever, uh, non-denominational church, and fit right in immediately, know everything that's going on immediately, but that's McDonald's. Do you, or would you rather go to something, you have to work in McDonald's, would you rather go somewhere, you know, where you're, it's a, it's a job. I mean, worship is a job. I mean, it's a job that we're yeah. privileged to have, but it's not just, it's not entertainment or anything like that. It, it really is work. It, it, it's the public work of the church, really. Yeah. Yeah. Liturgy has the word work in it. Ergos, right? Yeah. And like you said, is, is it worth it? Worship comes from worth ship. <laughs> That's the root word and word of the worship is worth Right. We're bringing something of worth and it, it takes some effort, but it's fun, too. Right. You know, it, Sunday is a day of 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 recreation or as we say in English, recreation. Um, it it recreates us. It renews us. And yes, it, you, on a long liturgy in Holy Week. Yeah, you're, you're actually physically kind of tired. Right. From it because yeah, you brought you something to fun. it. You can have fun playing a, a pickup baseball game if you've never played very much before. 
but you're probably gonna have a lot more fun if you've spent years of training and you're really good at it. And then all of a sudden it becomes, you, you start seeing things and, and appreciating it so much more and enjoying more. Same thing with the liturgy. The first time you go, yes, you can participate. You can know it's, you can kind of be there and stuff. But over time, it, it, you get mu so much more out of it um, the more you know. And that's why, but it takes time, like anything yeah. worth it. Yeah. Okay. So now should we actually go into the mass? Sure. Okay. So um, first thing you need to know, and people I think already know this, is the mass is already, there's two halves to it. And uh, there, it's called the mass of the catechumens and the mass of the faithful. Now, in the Novus Ordo world, you hear liturgy of the word, liturgy of the Eucharist. We don't use that language, right? This, this mass of the catechumens and mass of the faithful harkens back to the old evangelization, right? In right. which the catechumens, those who were not baptized, were being trained to, to know, love, and serve Christ and train in the doctrine uh, of the church. And they would be removed from the liturgy before the offertory. And so that first part of the mass is penitential and it's instructive. You have an epistle, you have a psalm in the form of a gradual, and then you have a gospel, and then you have a sermon and a creed. And that, that's kind of the hinge in which you get into the second, which is the mass of the faithful, which is the offertory oblation and then the, the actual sacrifice of Christ represented to the faithful, and then the communion rite, and then up to the final blessing. So, um, then, yeah, that traditional yeah, break between the, uh, the catechumens it, at the beginning, I think it, it can't be emphasized enough because today we look at worship as something to attract people, something to be uh, entertaining and something that should be relevant. All those terms that are used, that is literally the exact seeker friendly is another big one. That's right. literally the exact opposite of how the Christians first saw the mass in the early church. Because they literally would kick people out in the middle of it. I mean, that's not really, that's seeker unfriendly. <laughs> uh, but the purpose Can you imagine Joel point, Osteen yeah. saying, you know, at a halfway point, like, now all the newcomers, will you please stand up, everybody welcome. Okay, y'all leave. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. Right. <laughs> but that's exactly what they would say in the early church, because the mysteries were going to be celebrated right. in the second part of the Mass. And that was only for those who had been baptized. And it shows how the direction of the liturgy is towards God, not towards people. It's right. vertical, not horizontal. And so that, those names, like the liturgy of the word, liturgy of the Eucharist, they do get across the point. But I think the, the deeper point is that, that, that those old terms really say th there is a division in the mass. And it really is a, a true and kind of hard division, because if you're a catechumen, it's literally the end for you. You you then leave. So I think I, I just wanted to reemphasize that it, it helps you understand kind of what's going on and, and and the purpose of liturgy. I think. Right, right, and you know over time that that hard division and the dismissal obviously became lax. However, people have noted, scholars have noted that the the use of Latin. And the use of things like the iconostasis in the East, uh, the 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 uh, communion rail, all these things did create a a mystical hiding or a division or an exclusion. For example, as we'll get to it, when the priest says the Roman canon, the consecration, you don't hear one word of it. He whispers it as he as they have all the way back to the apostles. Right? It's not something that you're invited to hear and to watch, right? There is an exclusion. So in a sense, if a catechumen, even if a catechumen made it into the second half, he would still be away or apart from that reality. So, And it, and it reflects the, the somewhat the Jewish foundations of our faith, the Holy of Holies, that only the high priest could go into only once a year because they were directly interacting with God in that case. And they knew, they understood immediately, I cannot directly interact with God because it's just too much. Now, of course, with the new uh, covenant, that has changed. But at the same time, there is this idea of a holy of holies that happens at the liturgy, where the priest representing the people is now in the presence of, is bringing down God Almighty from heaven. I mean, literally. Yeah. 
And so I think that's kind of what you see that. And again, it's the, it's the nonverbal forms of communication. Yes, in the Novus Ordo, it's, these things are said. And so you know them because they're said. In the Latin mass, they are acted out, so to speak. Uh, you know, they, they are participating fully the whole body. The fact that the priest is not facing the people, the fact that he's whispering, the fact that it's in Latin, all these things are nonverbal cues that are saying what's going on here. So if you have no idea, you know immediately something holy is going on up there. I don't know right. what it is. Right. Same with the iconostasis, like you mentioned, it's the same thing in the East and, and things like that. So all those nonverbal cues are, are very important because we always communicate nonverbally all the time. Yeah. And so uh, it, it's just a way the church has realized that and makes it part of the liturgy. Right. And, and people will say, well, I can't hear what he's saying. That's not fair. And my response is he's not talking to you. <laughs> he's talking to God. <laughs> right. It doesn't it doesn't matter if you can't hear or understand the Te Igitu or any of the, any of the prayers of the canon because they are not addressed to you. Right. You know, that would be like me if I were speaking Spanish to the, I don't know, president of Mexico and you were standing by like, Hey, I can't hear what you guys are saying. It's like, well, I'm not talking to you. Well, a better analogy is it's like you're speaking intimately to your wife. Hmm. I have no, I don't have any right to hear that. I'd be like, hey, hey guys, I don't hear you guys. I don't hear what you guys are talking about. <laughs> well, yeah, because none of your business, dude. Back right. off. <laughs> well, that intimacy is a reflection of the intimacy that the priest has with God during the liturgy. And so you're not invited in to kind of be right. there, a, a third wheel, so to speak, at that point. Yes, you are part of participating in the Mass in a, in a different sense, but that's a, a more intimate. So you right. invite me into your home while I'm participating in your family life. But when it comes time for you, you may speak to you one of your kids or your wife or something, that's a different level of intimacy. I'm not invited to participate that level of intimacy right. with you. Right. So and I think we, the lay reflect. people are not ministerial priests. So we're not, we're not up there. We're not part of that. And that's, right. that's good. I mean, people are shocked. Pope Gregory the Great, St. Gregory the Great, at, at the time of, of his pontificate, when it came time for the Roman canon, they would actually close a curtain around him at the altar. So not only could you not hear him because he was whispering, speaking in Latin, but they also just closed him off. So it's almost the idea of an iconostasis, right? right. And then when he was done with the Roman canon, opened it up, you know? So it's a, it's a different way of, this is an oblation or an offering to God. Even, we'll get to this in a minute, even the epistle and the gospel, the reading and chanting of them are offerings to God. Right. When a, in the old rite, when a deacon was ordained, the bishop said to him, um, read the gospel for the living and the dead. In other words, it was an oblation. It was a sacrifice. Just the reading of the gospel in the mass. So, all right. So I think we should, I mean, we spent so much time in the yeah. prep. I think we need to move through the mass. Right. And um, I, if you go to a solemn high mass, the first thing you're going to see is the sprinkling of the holy water. A lot of people have never seen this before, Eric. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The asparagus at the beginning is, uh, I honestly, it might sound weird, but it's one of my favorite parts of the liturgy. Uh, me too. My I, kids I love, love it. it. Yeah, I know. I just love it. And it, it's you, every once in a while you'll see the sprinkling of holy water at a, at a new, at a new mass, not very often, but every once in a while on maybe Easter, especially Easter. So I think they're required to at Easter actually. Um, but different times, but it, it's very rare, but it's basically any, um, any high mass, you have this. And so yeah. it's just a uh, renewal of your baptismal, uh, uh, your baptism, your baptismal covenant. And it just reminds you that you are a member of God's church. I mean, yeah. It, yeah, the priest blesses and he exercises the water. There's an exorcism that happens. Yeah. And then they're chanting, Asparagus may, thou shalt sprinkle me with hyssop, O Lord, and I shall be cleansed. Thou shalt wash me, and I shall be whiter than the snow. So this is being chanted, right? And um, it's it's really cool in the Psalm High because the deacon and the sub the priest is wearing a cope, which is a giant cape, and the deacon and the sub deacon have the hem of it, and they're holding it open, so it looks like he's an angel, he has a giant like a wings, right. you know, like when Batman descends, you know, it's right. just, the cope is open, so his arms are free, so he can. You know, sh shake the holy water, right? Everywhere. Sprinkle everyone. And it's just, you know, when they, 
we hadn't been to, to Psalm High Mass for a while, and my seven year old, I, th- I don't think he'd ever remembered seeing it. And so it was, he, we were at a Psalm High Mass several months ago. And I remember when they were coming up the altar and he saw, you know, the beautiful vestments open and then water was hitting him. It was just yeah. like a deer in the headlights. Yeah. And yeah. I could just tell that afterwards he was just very satisfied by the whole experience. One thing about the, the sprinkling rite, but also the uh, prayers at the foot of the altar, which we'll get to next, is that there's a great emphasis at the beginning of Mass that we're all sinners who are showing up mm-hmm. here. And mm-hmm. there's begging for mercy. And right. so that, and that's basically the sprinkling is, you know, I shall be whiter than snow. I'm not whiter than snow because of all my sins, but you can make me whiter than snow. And I think in the in new masters, like basically just the, the, there's the, the um, confitior that you know said, and that's like one thing, and that's it. But in the in the old mass, there's a great emphasis on the fact that you are a sinner showing up here, and you are not worthy to be here. And in fact, yes. if it was if it was based on your worth and your power, you should be kicked out. You should die, frankly, for being in the presence of God like this. Right. That's why there's so so many prayers at the beginning that are. God, we beg your mercy. You can make us worthy. We're not worthy, but you can through your through your mercy. And so I think that's it's a beautiful part. You know, there's this emphasis on like the idea that the modern church is all about mercy and the old church was all about how terrible people were and condemning them. Well, look at the old mass at the beginning of it. It's all about crying for mercy. I mean, the whole thing is about mercy and how we we're sinners and we need your mercy. So that and that's true mercy, recognizing I, yeah, I don't, I don't belong here in, in one sense. Yeah, the, after that part, uh, the Latin says, I saw water flowing from the right side of the temple, alleluia, and all to whom that water came were saved, and they shall say, alleluia, alleluia. So, you know, the, Christ is the temple, and the water flowing from the right side is the, is the wound, you know, right. at his heart. And so uh, everyone who comes to that water, which is through baptism, and the priest is, lit, you're literally getting hit with drops of holy water when this is happening. So again, it's, it's, it's heads up. Right. Yeah. You can't experience it like this, right? It's exactly. heads up. You're, it's sensory, you know, you're, you're getting hit with water and you're hearing this beautiful chant and, and the, the text is, you know, I shall become wider than snow. Anyone who comes to this water will be saved. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So it's beautiful. Right. Yeah. Okay. So then there's a prayer. Um, and um, it's, it's well, interesting. Yeah. The next prayer yeah. is a prayer that an angel will come from heaven and protect everyone who is in this, this home, this dwelling. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love, love that. that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so it really it's great. like before mass even starts is a, Hey, send an angel down and just protect us while we're in this building. It doesn't say church, you know, it's uh, what's the, uh, yeah, it's basically Habutakalo. Habutakalo. Yeah. So it's like a it's like a habitat. It's really it's probably dwelling is the best best way to to understand it. So I like that too, right? Before we even met, we cut the angel protecting the building, and then comes uh, the priest goes to, to the foot of the altar, and it's in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and he begins the prayers at the foot of the altar, which is a confession that even the priest is unworthy. To begin this holy rite. That's why he's at the foot of the altar. He doesn't go up to the altar yet because he acknowledges, I'm not worthy. I'm a human being just like everybody else here. I'm not worthy, even though I'm ordained. I'm not worthy just to walk up to the altar like it's a table or something like that. I have to first pray at the foot of the altar, which for those who aren't sure, almost every new churches are all different now. But so when it's celebrated there, they do their best. But in your old churches, you always had steps that led up to the altar. And so they will be at the bottom of the steps for these prayers. And now one thing to know for those who haven't gone very much, or th- these have all been abolished in the new mass. This is the, probably the, I would say the big, I mean, there's a lot of differences, right. but as far as the structure of prayers, this is the biggest one because all the prayers of the altar have just been removed. And so yeah. that, that's a huge difference, but that's, yeah, that happened, that happened yeah. around 19, even before the Novus Ordo came out, that started happening around 1965. Oh, is that right? I didn't know yeah, that. Yeah, prayers at the foot of the altar and the last gospel from the beginning and the end got chopped off. Right. In, in the name of efficiency, I'm sure. Right. So, But yeah, the, well, those prayers at the foot of the altar are beautiful because, again, they are 
the priest saying that he's not worthy. And those, those prayers are said in conjunction with a server, uh, typically, and the server will give the responses. If you're, if you have a son, uh, who serves at the uh, Latin mass, you'll know that the, the, the first thing they really have to overcome and, and, and the, the biggest struggle is they have to learn those prayers at the foot of the altar and they, their responses to them. And so it's really an interaction between the priest and the server or servers. Like a low mass has this, these prayers, the high mass does too. So there's this interaction where the priest will say something and then the server will respond and they'll kind of go back and forth. Yeah. And it's not for the people in the congregation. It's basically the server and the, and the priest who are, who are doing all these prayers. Yeah, this, this, is, this is the prep for the priest who's, like you said, he's at the foot. I'll just read a little bit of it. Here. The priest says, I will go in unto the altar of God. And then the response is, unto God who giveth joy to my youth. Judge me, O God, and distinguish my cause against the ungodly nation. Deliver me from the unjust and deceitful men. And so on and so forth. It's from the Psalms. Yeah. You Psalm yeah. Yeah. So, so, um, so yeah, yeah, I mean, this is, this is pretty powerful and you see, you'll see the priest up at the front and he'll make his confession his confidior and he'll bend. You'll see him bow. Right. And then you'll actually see the servers say the, um, it's not really like a formal absolution, but it's may God have mercy on you. And you'll see them kind of tilt into him. Right. And then they'll bow and they'll say the confidior. So the confidior is said two times, once by the priest and then also by the servers. Or if it's the deacon and the subdeacon, they'll be right up there doing it for them. And in many ways, the servers kind of represent us because the servers are typically lay people as well. Obviously, in the old days, if there was more priests and seminarians, they'd be seminarians. But in a sense, they represent us. So if you feel like, you know, a lot of times people feel like they should say those responses. No, you, you don't say those responses. The servers do. And that's kind of their role. They're up there representing you. Uh, your, your, their interaction with the priest is kind of like your interaction with the priest. Right. Yeah, they're your proxy. Right. Yeah. And people who know Latin and study Latin, they're like, well, I want to say these parts. Right. right. But no, especially in the low mass, we don't respond. We let the server right. do it because it just I've, I've actually been to a Latin mass where the people were invited to dialogue. Right. And it's a train wreck because yeah. people have different cadences. It's Latin. Right. People even have different pronunciations of Latin from a French to a German. Some people right. will do classical stuff. So <laughs> it, it gets really complicated. Yeah. So it's better just, especially if it's a low mass, the server says it, unite your hearts. I even move my lips, right. but I don't say anything in union with that server. So, and also the confidior in the Latin mass, Eric is longer and better than the one in the right. Novus Ordo. Oh yeah. It says, I confess to almighty God, to blessed Mary of a virgin, to blessed Michael, the archangel, to blessed John, the Baptist, to the holy apostles, Peter and Paul, and to all the saints and to you, father, that I have sinned exceedingly in thought, word, and deed. May a culpa, may a culpa, may a maxima culpa. Therefore, I beseech, and it repeats the saints there again. So you're in, in the new one, you're not getting all these extra saints. Here you've got Michael, John the Baptist, Peter and Paul, and all the saints. In yeah, there aside as well. from just the power of the prayer being more powerful because you're literally just asking more people to intercede for you, it also brings in the importance of the fact that we're in this communion with these saints. They're, in a sense, right. participating in Mass as well. And we're calling on them to help us. And it, this is kind of silly, but I always did kind of think like once I learned this was like, what did like John the Baptist think when he was like booted from the mass? I mean, it's like, you know, here he was, right. he'd been asked to intercede for all these people for centuries. And now all of a sudden it's like, no, nah, we don't really need your help anymore. I mean, he's my patron. So I, I that's why I think of right. first, but I'm just, obviously I know in heaven, they think differently, but the, it just was kind of like, why did we drop him? I mean, what's wrong right. with John the Baptist? And, and yeah, what, well, I mean, the reason, if you read Bunini and these guys, the reason they, is because Protestants found this objectionable. Why, when you were confessing your sins to God, would you bring in somebody else like a saint? Right. And we would say, well, because we need the help. Yeah, <laughs> right? yeah exactly. I mean, that's the whole point. But, is. And it's also, it's, it's, it's powerful that before the mass begins, we lay people see the priest confessing his sins aloud in front of the congregation. Right. When do you ever see that in the new mass? Never. Right. Yeah. I mean, think and about it's it. Not just, there and say, yeah, I'm I mean, a sinner. That's right. And he says it right there and he asks for mercy. And then someone next to him, a server, you know, says, 
May Almighty God have mercy upon you, forgive you of your sins, and bring you to everlasting life. Another thing that's omitted in the New Mass is we hear that part, which I just read in the New Mass, but then the priest um, says the indulgentium part, which is may Almighty God, may the Almighty and merciful Lord grant us pardon, absolution, and remission of all our sins. Which is powerful. Is That's it, also, it, so for some reason, they wiped that out of the new mass as well. Yeah. It's kind of a common thing. I think people watch this might know this is that often uh, Catholics, uh, more kind of practicing Catholics, during, when, it, when in the new mass, we say, may, all, may God be merciful and forgive us our sins, bring us everlasting life, make the sign of the cross a lot. But in the old mass, if you want to do that, and they, that's always optional. It's really probably more appropriate to make it during that second one, the second prayer when he's giving, he's actually giving absolution, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, in a sense to make it during that. Just, just a thing. Again, it's an optional thing. But if you're kind right. of wondering, oh, when do I make the sign of the cross? I'd like doing that. That reminds me. Well, that that'd probably be the more appropriate time. Yeah, to do you it. do it, it at that point, point. and that's when the yeah. server does it. Right. So just follow the server up front. I think people in the new mass who make the sign of the cross there because it's not in the books are actually hearkening back to this old. Latin mass custom, yeah. but the yeah. prayer has been removed. So they had to right. Bump move it up their sign bit. of the cross, yeah. but at right. least they're trying, you know, I, I get yeah, that. Exactly. It's good. Yep. So after all of that, then the priest ascends the steps of the altar, right? So now he's, he's confessed his unworthiness. Uh, he's, you know, called down to God's mercy and you'll see the servers lift up the hem of the front of his, his alb and he'll, go up the stairs. And no, it's only the priest. In general, there are times in which a server is up at the altar, but it's they, it's restricted as much as possible. Sometimes it's just necessary yeah. for different reasons, the master ceremonies, things like that might be up there, what, you know, different kinds. But the, the server does not go up there because it's representing up at the top of the steps at the altar. That is the Holy of Holies. And so only the high priest in a sense. In fact, when you, uh, we're talking about the Psalm High Master, you had deacon, subdeacon, the deacon and subdeacon stand on the steps most of yes. the time. Uh, the, the deacon in the kind of the middle of the steps and the subdeacon at the bottom. And so again, it's kind of representing the high priest is the only one at the altar. Uh, you know, like I said, different times you might have a server go up there for various reasons, but it's kind of showing that. And during definitely during the uh, the consecration and everything, the priest is up there alone, and you might have a master ceremony is kneeling, but they always go back even. Yeah. Um, it, it, because they kind of make sure everybody knows this is the Holy of Holies and only the high priest is, is allowed there. Yeah. So the next part is the intro it. This is the, this is the priest entering into the Holy of Holies. And so there's a special one for every mass that depends on the feast day or the Sunday changes all the time. And then there's the Kyrie. Oh, did and you want to add something there? About the, yeah. yeah, on the intro, uh, one thing to note is that a lot of the Old Mass is very fixed. The Eucharistic mm-hmm. prayer, for example, the, the, the canon is always the same. There's the not a lot of options. Available. Yeah, there's not a lot of options. Which is but good. There are, yes, there are a few, and, and that's, or not options, but variable parts is probably a better, uh, is what I really mean. Right. And like, so the intro, so when you're following along in a missile, that's when typically you're going to flip if you have a big missile. And so right. typically at a mass, you're going to have your, your ribbons going to be in you know, multiple ribbons, but there's really two ribbons you're going to have. One is for the actual canon, the, the actual ordinary of the mass. That's where it's going to be most of the time. And you're going to have one for whatever the day it is. So if it's, you right. know, the, the second Sunday in Lent or whatever, you have one there. And those are going to be the primary two that you're going to flip between. And so, for example, prayers for the altars in the ordinary and then when you get the intro, you, you skip back to the, you skip over to the, the day and then you come back. And that's kind of now some masses, you flip a lot more than that. But in general, those are the two. Now, if you're using this book, they don't have the variable part, variable parts, this little booklet. They just have the ordinary. So you don't do any flipping, but you don't see the prayers of the day either or the readings right. or anything like that. Yeah. The parts that flip would be the intro, which we just mentioned, the collect, which is the prayer for the day. Then you have the epistle, and then a gradual tract, gospel, offertory verse, the secret, the communion, and the post-communion, right? And so those are the parts that change. And if you have that little red book that he's using, it doesn't have those parts. The reason this is so thick is because it, it literally has 
every one of those for every day, every feast day, every Sunday, you know, the special epistle, gospel, all that in here. That's why it goes from, I mean, the actual mass itself is only here. Right. I, uh, which one, what, for, what, which one do you have? In front of me, I was going to get the Angelus one, but I, right now I have the St. Andrews. Okay. And then and I, I also have the, have the Father Lassant. Okay. I want to get that one. I don't have, I have the, the Baroness Press. It's called the Roman Missal. Yeah. It's a very mm-hmm. good one. I like it a lot. Yeah. They all do the same thing. There's just, yeah. you know, different fonts, different artwork, things like that. So, I mean, that's the actual Latin mass right here. Right. And then all the other stuff is are the propers, right? So, <laughs> all right. So, um, then we get into the Kyrie and it's, you know, it's, it, Kyrie is actually a Greek part of the mass. It means Lord have mercy. And it's ninefold, not sixfold. The Novus Ordo, it's Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. Christ have mercy, oh, Christ have yeah. mercy, yeah. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. So it's it's basically the priest says it and you say it. Whereas here it's more Trinitarian. So there's Kyrie eleison three times, Christe eleison, which is Christ, three times, and then Kyrie eleison, Holy Ghost, three times. So okay. it's it's more Trinitarian. It's more tripled. It's three, 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 ninefold. And as sung mass, high mass, this will be sung by the yes. choir typically. Uh, the entire thing will be sung. That, that's another disconcerting thing people don't always understand. There's a at a sung mass, at a low mass, the priest does everything basically, but with the servers. But at a sung mass or high mass and a psalm high mass, there are actually parts that, as far as what you hear, is only you only the choir does it. And so the Kyrie often will be sung by the choir. The priest won't say it at all. When the priest gets finished with the intro, the Kyrie, the Kyrie no, he'll just say starts. it. He'll say he'll, it quietly. He'll, Right. That's what. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. But he won't exactly. say it out. He'll he, the priest will say everything in here. Right. But he'll he'll say it. He'll actually, you know, sometimes he actually goes on in places in the mass. Right. But you'll hear the this really beautiful curie. The same is true with the Gloria, the Creed, where you'll hear the all you'll hear is the choir singing it. And it won't always be synced up with what the priest is doing. And that, right. I know that threw me for a while at yeah. first was. I was like, wait a minute, the priest, I, I could see the priest is doing one thing, but then the choir is still singing something else. And I, I just kind of was like, it just kind of messed me up at first. But once you kind of get that that's what's going on, it's not a big deal because you get to hear the Kyrie beautifully sung. And sometimes it's, I've, it's been different every different parish I've been to. Sometimes the congregation will sing with the, um, with the, the, the mm-hmm. choir. Sometimes they won't. Sometimes I've seen, you know, like where the creed is sung, where the, the, the choir will sing some, a line and then the, the congregation will sing the other line. I've seen a lot of different ways mm-hmm. to do it, but the choir always is what's leading it for the congregation to hear. Right. Yeah. At our parish, the people sing along with the Kyrie and the Gloria. You don't have to, but people do at the song, at the high mass. Okay. So then you have the Gloria, which is of course, chat and channel that now i guess there's not much difference you'll notice that people will bow whenever the name of jesus is said uh, in a sermon or in a lesson or in a gospel or even in the gloria so when the name of jesus is said you'll see just uh you'll also see the clergy take off their beretta and put it back on they're showing reverence for the holy name of jesus and also at certain parts of the prayer like when you when you hear the sushi pay You'll also see people do a, a bow, um, but you know, just look around. You'll 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 catch on to what's going on. Right. And then the next part is the epistle, right? The collect. Oh, the the collect. Did we skip the collect? Oh yeah, yeah. The next one's the collect, right. and that's the collection of the intentions of the church for that day. And it's usually very short and simple. Right. But still, often very powerful. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. That's what's great about them is, you know, they're they're so ancient, the colics yeah. and they don't, there's not a lot of fluff and mess with right. them, but they just get right to the point. Yeah. They particularly in, in the Latin. Yeah. And then there is the epistle. Usually the, this will yeah. be a epistle from Paul or Peter or, you know, one of the apostles, but it now, can be not an epistle. Yeah. Right now. Here's where. Yeah, it could be. It's always called the epistle, but it could be from the Old Testament. Uh, and so just deal with it. Um, <laughs> but I think this is where you get a little bit of the, the, the friction between the new mass and the old mass. And I admit, 
I, I have a little bit of a, uh, I, I kind of move between them because the readings in, in the, in the old mass, there's only two readings. There's the, the epistle and the gospel. And of course, in the new mass, there's usually a reading, there's a first, second reading in gospel. You have the you first is usually Old Testament. Second is usually one of Paul, Paul's letters and in the, the gospel, obviously the gospel. And I've heard, I've, I've been in debates upon which is better and I've argued often for the, the new mass way, to be honest. Uh, but I started to see more and more the arguments for the way the old mass does it. But just for the purposes of today, what matters is there's only one non-gospel reading. And so it's the epistle usually from Paul. And uh, so that's just something to note. And in, in, the, in a low mass, the priest will always read it on the, you know, at the altar He's not, and he's facing the altar when he's reading it. He doesn't go up to like a special lectern or ambo or anything like that to read. He reads it right there in Latin. And I know a lot of people get like, wait a minute, it's a reading in Latin. Why is he doing that? I, I think, again, we can, we, I don't really go down that whole path. Often they'll end up before their, their homily, they'll read it in English for people, especially on Sundays. But the priest will read up there. In a sung mass, that's also where it will be uh, read or, or chanted. But in a solemn high mass, what happens is the subdeacon reads it. Typically, yep. somewhere up in the sanctuary, they, they usually there's a certain place they stand in the master ceremonies. A server yep. will stand next to them, and they chant it from there. So just different places, but it's the same thing being read. But it always be on the epistle side of the gospel. Right. Yeah. Good point. Right. Which is on our on right, side. looking at the altar. Right. And there's so. there's something here too. I don't want to get too into the the mystagogy of the latin mass but you know the subdeacon um it's been said represents the people of israel and the deacon represents the gentile peoples and the priest obviously represents christ himself and so the the interplay and the action and the places of israel and the gentiles positioned with christ actually tells the story of redemption and uh, we'll get to it, but at the very end, the subdeacon actually holds up the last gospel to the priest at the very, very end, which is after the blessing. And that represents the conversion of the, the eschatological conversion of the people of Israel to Christ, holding up that last final gospel of his incarnation. But you'll see, you know, you know, based on what they read, where they stand, which step they're on, there's all kinds of mysterious Every things going on here. single action. Every single movement, every single placement has a meaning. You don't have to know it, right? But you, but just know that there is a meaning. I mean, the the, the idea of the subdeacon. I was just, I was literally at Psalm High Mass yesterday, and the idea of the subdeacon holding the gospel, the last gospel. What a beautiful thing! And it, it, what is the last gospel? The fact that the Word became flesh and dwelt flesh. among us. The conversion of the the the, the, the old people of God, the, the Jewish people. I mean, it just. The symbolism yeah. there is just, it, it's so powerful. Yeah. Once you know it, it, it does kind of, I, I forget most of that stuff. I've learned a lot of it, but I forget most of that stuff most of the time. But every once in a while, I'll be there and I'll remember it. And I'll be like, oh yeah. And it just like, it kind of hits yeah. you. Yeah. Or during the consecration, the subdeacon representing the people of Israel puts a veil over his eyes with the patent in there, right? So he's, 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 yeah. he's blind to the reality there on the altar by rejecting the, the incarnation of Christ. All just, kinds of yeah, cool yeah, things just, are happening there. It is cool. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, um, so the, and it, one, one, if you, if you end up going on an Ember day on a Saturday, there's going to be a lot more lessons. Oh yeah. Just be ready for that. Um, the gradual. So gradus means steps. And this is when the, the missile, you'll see the missile, the, the server or, you know, one, one of the, the uh, assistants will move the missile from the epistle side down to the center to a genuflection and up onto the north side of the altar or our left side of the altar. So when this is happening, there's the gradual, which is a psalm and it's chanted in a high mass. One thing I wanted to note about what you just said about how the, the server moves. So in the old liturgy, whenever anybody crosses in front of the tabernacle, you always face the tabernacle and genuflect, always. I was actually taught when I first became Catholic by a good priest, a Novus Ordo priest, a good priest and litur liturgical ag expert, that during the Mass you don't genuflect. In the new Mass, you don't genuflect during Mass in front of you know, all, uh, the tabernacle. 
So whatever that might be. But the point is that the old mass you always do. And in fact, you, you don't walk in front of the tabernacle at the altar either. So when a server goes up to get the missile, it's just like cross right over. He comes down to the bottom of the steps and then he goes back up. And that's just a, a sign of respect and, and, and just what's what's there. Again, the holy the holies idea. So that's that's really what's going on. And that's the stuff you notice that's different that you might pick up on like, boy, they seem to be real formal about this. Like, you know, why they're not just like carrying it over there or something like that, passing it yes. over. Everything's very formal activity, very milita militaristic as well, yeah. uh, just with the, uh, the way the servers are supposed to act and things like that. Yeah. And, and remember, traditionally, the churches, East and West, Roman Rite, Eastern Rites, were always facing the East. Very important. I had a Eastern Orthodox friend who's a priest, and they were building a new church, buying a new church, and they got this great lot, great price, right part of town they wanted to be in. But the way the lot was laid out, they couldn't orient the church to the East. And I said, so what do you do? So we walked. We couldn't buy it. There's no yeah. way our bishop would allow us to build a church that didn't face east yeah. or east, you know. And good I was like, them. "Good for you, good for you." Yeah. You know, we Catholics we talk about liturgical east, and okay, that works. But traditionally, these churches were facing the east. The south represented Israel, and the north represented the Gentiles, the people north, you know, the Assyrians and all those people. And so that's that movement in the mass moves from the people of Israel to the Gentiles. And so the gospel presentation moves north. And in a solemn high mass, you'll actually see the deacon who's blessed by the priest. He actually will go very far north beyond the altar and actually face not the people, but he'll face to the north, almost like looking at the wall of the church. And, and that's because he's proclaiming it to the, to the Gentiles. That's great. Yep. So then comes the sermon. Well, the, the gospel, reading the gospel, right? I guess we said okay, that. Okay, sorry. Uh, and you'll see incense on that in the Psalm High. Right. And, oh, you know, one other thing that we didn't mention, um, there's the, the, the priest, the deacon, the subdeacon. You might notice that the guy dressed up like a subdeacon and the guy dressed up like a deacon are priests. Right. And That's another thing that shocks people. Yeah, almost always. The right. subdeacon and the deacon are the, you know, the vicars or the assistant priest there at the parish. And you might even see your pastor, like on Sunday, our pastor was the subdeacon. Right. That's right. And the assistant, that. yeah. And the assistant was the, was the main priest celebrant. And the reason for that is because you kind of lose this in the Novus Ordo, but every priest is a deacon. When he gets, right. when he's a deacon, then he gets ordained a priest. He doesn't stop being a deacon. Once a deacon, always a deacon. Same with the subdeacon, which was which was abolished by Paul the Six, Pope Paul the Six. When when you're when you're a subdeacon, you become a deacon. You're still a subdeacon. When you're a priest, you're still an acolyte. You're still a subdeacon. You're still a deacon. All those minor lower orders, right, retain inside the priesthood. And so, yeah. so yeah, why is the priest like a, a priest. deacon? And, yeah. He, he's not a deacon. Yeah, he is a deacon. Right. Yeah. So and you'll see that as well. Just because of, you know, somebody who is a seminarian who has been ordained a deacon but not yet a priest can become a, um, you know, can serve as deacon then because they're, they're actually a deacon. So you could have right. that, but that's so, there's not very many of them obviously at any one time and just because of sure. the numbers game. And so that's why it's typically a priest. And it's funny because, you know, the new, or we, we, we even call it a transitional deacon meaning they're not going to be a deacon anymore after they become a priest. That's what we say in the new, right? right. And uh, but as you're saying, really, you're never a transitional deacon. You're always a permanent deacon once you're ordained a deacon. You just might also be a permanent priest. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I mean, when a, when a man becomes a bishop, we don't say he's no longer a priest. We understand he still is a priest, and he's also still a deacon. In fact, in the old, old rite, the bishops wore a chasuble, which is the vestment of the priest, a dalmatic underneath that, which is the vestment of the deacon, and underneath that, the tunicle. He had three vestments on, showing, and then his bishop's mitre, showing, I'm a bishop, I'm a priest, I'm a deacon, I'm a subdeacon. Everything you to, on. You had to be a real man to do all that, especially if you live like in Florida or Texas or something. That's <laughs> right. That's right. So, um, okay, so then comes the sermon, and um, I find the sermons are usually very good. 
Sometimes there's some duds. That happens. You know, these are humans. I was really excited. Yesterday um, was the feast of St. Joseph. It was March 19th. And um, the priest at the sermon said, uh, today's sermon is from St. Bernard of Clairvaux. And he read St. Bernard of Clairvaux's sermon on St. Joseph. And I thought, how cool is that? You know, like so, so often, you know, like in the Novus Ordo, if the priest, you know, maybe he had a hospital visit or something happened and he couldn't prepare a homily or a sermon, he would just kind of wing it. And it might be kind of a bummer. Why not, if you don't have a sermon ready, borrow one of the great sermons from one of the doctors of the church, theologians, church fathers, and just read it. I wasn't put out at all by it. I was actually thrilled. I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. We get a little treat. This is Bernard of Clairvaux's sermon for today. Yeah, it's timeless. I mean, it, it always applies. Also, in the the priests are uh, told in the new in, in the new rite in those ordo that they're supposed to tie their sermon into the readings, particularly the gospel. It's actually a direction that they're told to do. Uh, whereas that's not that does not really apply in the old. I see that a lot of times they will. But you, I, it's much more say, common in my experience. In our church, seventy percent of the time, it's tied into the epistle and the gospel, right. and I prefer that. But there's other times right. where they will it's address something else. Want, yes, exactly. And so, just note that that you might notice that sometimes the priest will give a sermon that had nothing to do with the readings, might not even reference the readings at all, because he feels like there's something that needs to be addressed with the community, with the church, or whatever that he wants to address. So. Just right. something that, that you might notice. <clears throat> yeah. Another thing you'll, that you should be aware of is I've noticed this pretty much everywhere I've gone to Latin Mass in America. I don't know what it's like in Europe or other places, but the the uh, announcements will be placed here. You know, it's it's kind. Of, I think it's irreverent in the Novus Ordo. You just received the body of Christ. You're back at your pew praying. Like, hey, we have a couple announcements, and right. a couple of announcements always means six, not two. Right. And you're like, oh, I'm trying to pray here. I just received the Eucharist and I'm having to hear about the bake sale and the yeah. gluten-free cookies and the youth group meeting and all that. And it's just not a good fit. And so what I've noticed is if there are announcements, they'll usually he'll 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 come up and so he'll come into the pulpit and he'll say the epistle for today is and he'll read it in English. So you hear it in English. The gospel for today is and you'll stand here, too, by the way, and you'll you'll still do this. And he'll read the gospel of the day. And then he'll say there's, you know, an announcement. He'll say what it is. Knights of Columbus are having a, a donation lunch after mass today. And the second collection is for such and such. And then our priests always say, let's begin with a prayer. Everybody will pray a Hail Mary with him. And then he'll stand back up or turn back around and he'll just start preaching. My is that how yours is? Yeah, typically we don't always say the prayer beforehand, but yes, it'd just be announcements. That, read the epistle, read the <clears throat> gospel um, in English, say the announcements, and then go on. Or they sometimes they'll say announcements at the end of the homily, but usually it's at the beginning. Actually, they'll do the announcements before they even do the readings, I think, because they want to kind of make sure that doesn't interrupt the flow of it. Yeah, maybe but they do that in mind too. Yeah, and the other thing, though, I've noticed is that at Latin Mass parishes, the reverence that I talk about that creeps in, that you start, they just start experiencing. It also creeps into the homily. There, are, my experience at least has been there's way less kind of happy clappy jokes. Yeah, yeah I mean, a priest might say something funny sometimes because you know just it kind of fits whatever like that, and everybody chuckles or whatever. But that's that's more that's rare, and there's almost no like let's have a funny joke to make everybody like me type of joke. I mean, that almost never happens. Like, look at me, I'm like doing a stand up back up here. It's just it goes straight to. Uh, talking about doctrine, talking about application, about morals, whatever the, the scriptures, whatever the case may be. And that doesn't make it dull. Somebody might think like, you know, that might make it dull. Cause I mean, I've done a lot of public speaking and I always make sure I have a joke or two in there because I want to lighten up the crowd. I'm not giving a homily though. <laughs> I'm giving a talk to a crowd and right. that's different. And so I, I, that's been my experience. Obviously the priest can do whatever he wants up there, but most priests who are celebrating the Latin mass it's much more solemn their their uh, their homily than than you would find at your typical um, Novus Ordo Mass. Yeah, I, I agree with that. You'll also notice that the the priest will remove the maniple, which is a vestment that was eradicated in the Novus Ordo, but it's a it's something that hangs off his left arm like a waiter has a you know a, a linen thing when he comes to your table. You know, formal. That's the same idea, right? He has one of these, and it shows that he's a servant. 
It's symbolic that he's there to serve. But at the sermon, he ceases to be a servant and he begins a prophet. He's a teacher, right? Christ the prophet. And so now he has a magisterial authority. So you'll see him. He'll take the maniple off, kiss it, and he'll lay it on the missile. And then he'll go to the pulpit. And that's when you know he's going to preach. And we have to mention here too, Eric, this is going to shock some people. Sometimes in a low daily mass, never on a Sunday, but on a low daily mass, there will be no sermon. And my parish just... almost never is. It's, it's okay. on the daily mass. In fact, it was when uh, Ash Wednesday, they had one. It's a, but it's a very early mass. It's for people going before work. Right. Uh, it's an older priest who actually needs help even going up the steps. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, you know, so I, I think his energy level might not be the greatest. And so he just never says, and it's great. I mean, and not great, but it's, it's fine. There's no, right. there's nothing wrong with it. Um, we're still getting same graces and everything like that. And in fact, I was yeah. shocked when he came out for when, when Ash Wednesday, when he finished reading the gospels and I saw him start going over, I was like, Oh my gosh, he's going to, he's going to give a homily. It was, it was great. It was a great homily. I was like, wish you yeah. could do more, but I understand, you know, right. yeah. it's most for people getting to work. You know, they, they need to get to work. Yeah, oftentimes and, it's an early morning so. or, you know, the priest needs to maybe go somewhere, you know, there's something that needs to be attended to. So sometimes you'll just, you'll just go right into the creed or right into the offertory and that's okay too. So you, that's kind of traditional, and, and you know, some people are a little bit shocked by that, but just in case, you might see that. But it shows the sermon is not essential to no. the liturgy. It's, a, it's a good instructional time. There's the good things about exhortations, things like that, but it's not essential. Yeah, I think it was, it was made essential on Sundays only at the Council of Trent. I might be wrong on that. Okay. But I think it was the Council of Trent that instructed that Sunday Masses must have a sermon, which Excuse means that... that. Though, so, yeah, yeah, that wasn't always the case, right. right? Yeah. Okay, so then there's the creed. And the biggest difference here is that when it gets to et incarnatus est, de spiritu sancto, by the incarnation of the whole, uh, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Blessed Virgin Mary, right? That part, you are going right. to hit the knees. Right. Take and don't time. worry, everybody else is doing it. So you're not, if it's only your first time there, once everybody starts kneeling, what usually happens is, I find, most people who haven't been before, they sit down because that's what people are doing. Ah, uh, right. right. They, they see people going kneeling. down. Yeah, they're, yeah. they're actually kneeling for that part. And then you'll see everybody will get up and you'll get up. Now, here's the tricky part on the sung mass. The priest may do it at a different time because he's saying it secretly, a bit quietly. And while the, the, the um, choir is singing it, he's singing it at a different rate. So you'll see he will genuflect and all the servers will. But the at least in my experiences, the congregation doesn't then, although I've seen people mess it up and do that sometimes, we do it when we're actually here from the choir. And so what you'll see is the priest will um, genuflect. And the other thing about the sung mass is during the creed, you typically, eventually the priest will sit down and everybody else sits down as well. That throws people off because you're sitting for the creed and you Correct. think, wait a minute, I thought I'm supposed to stand for the whole creed. But during a sung mass, what will happen is the priest will sit down, usually sometime after the part where you genuflect, and then he just sits down. And once he sits down, all the servers sit down, except for the master ceremonies, and then, and then everybody else sits yeah. down. I've seen some variation on this. I would say keep your eyes open and just right. follow Do everybody else. But yeah, exactly. but yeah, you're right. that You, you will often see the, the celebrant will genuflect before everyone else does. Sometimes you'll see the celebrant genuflect and then he'll go to the foot of the altar and he'll wait for the incarnatus right. est for everybody else. And he will genuflect again then and then he will go sit down. He kind of sinks right. it up. That's how I, we did it in Florida. Yeah, I think I that's how we do it, too. That might be um, he does but I've seen different that. things before. And then comes the offertory. Right. And this is uh, they'll, sometimes there'll be a bell. The priest will take the, there's a veil over the chalice when he takes it off. Sometimes there'll be a bell. Do y'all have a bell at that point? Uh, I don't think I we, I don't think we do. Yeah, I've seen it different. I think it's actually rare, but I've noticed lately a bell. Well, and now we're in the Mass of the Faithful as well, just to make sure people that's know. That's right. Now we've gone before. from Mass of Catechumens into the Mass of the Faithful. And, and people say, well, when do you have to be at Mass to have missed your Sunday obligation. I've been told by traditional priests this point. Okay. I've heard in Novus Ordo, you have to be there for the gospel. Yeah, I've heard a million different things. Yeah. I like the idea you have to be there for Mass of the Faithful because that really is the core. Traditional priests have told me if you get there and the priest has already taken the veil off the chalice and the start of the offertory, you missed 
mass. Now, if you missed it just because it wasn't your fault or there's a major traffic, you still make your obligation. But if you were sleeping in and you missed that, you got to go to mass again. So at this point, there's a series of seven prayers, all of which but one, I think, were abolished in the Novus Ordo. Yeah, I think and right. for people who talk about the differences between the new the Novus Ordo Mass and the traditional Latin Mass, this is ground. This is maybe not the ground zero. It might be ground zero because the most drastic changes, besides facing the people and changing the Latin, but the actual text of the Mass right here in the offertory is quite different than the Novus. The Novus Ordo has how's it go? It's been so long. Blessed are you, yeah. Lord God of all creation. creation. Uh, through your goodness, goodness, we, we have this bread to offer, yeah. Yeah, bread and offer, work yeah, of right. human hands, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. That, you know, compare that to this. This is the yeah. opening prayer for the offertory. Receive, O Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, this spotless host, which I, thy unworthy servant, offer unto thee, my living and true God, for mine own countless sins, offenses, and negligences, and for all here present as also for all faithful Christians living and dead, that it may avail both for my own and their salvation unto life eternal. Amen. That's just prayer one of seven. You're just getting started. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, did y'all hear that? I mean, that is talking about sin, offenses, negligences, his salvation, our salvation, offering the spotless host. I mean, a I Protestant mean, couldn't agree with any of that. That is the first time, I'm sorry, the first time I followed along in a missile at Mass. That was the number one thing I noticed. I was blown away by the power and depth of the prayers. I, and I had some friends who went with me. Our, it was actually our parish. It was a Novus Ordo parish. This is about 15 years ago or something like that. And we got a new priest and he won. This was right after, actually, so it wasn't 15 years ago. It was right after the um, uh, Pope Benedict uh, liberalized uh, celebrating the Latin Mass. I guess that's like 11 or 12 years ago. And our Novus Ordo Parish, the, the priest, the guy, new priest, and he said, I'm going to celebrate this on like the first Sunday. Uh, and so a bunch of people went and me and a couple of my buddies went and um, other dads, you know, and everything, Catholics and stuff. And, and that was the thing we talked about afterwards that we were just, cause we were following along. I had gone a few times before, but I hadn't had a missile. It was the first time I really followed along in the missile and everything. I mean, blown away. There's no other term for it that just yeah. could not believe. And the same thing we said, we all said the same thing was like, why on earth was this taken from us? Right. Why on earth was this taken from us? I mean, this beautiful heritage, this, these powerful prayers, why on earth would you ever want to take these away? It just yeah. made no sense to us. And it still doesn't really. I mean, I, I know that I know a lot of the reasons why and stuff like that. And they're not, not really that great. But at the same time, I just it just it, it blows you away for somebody who didn't know any of the history. At this point, I didn't know any of this history. I didn't know why the mass had changed or anything like that. And it just it was it was crazy. And this is and I agree, this is the kind of ground zero of those prayers that you yeah. really see the power of. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's also the invocation of the Holy Spirit. Come, O sanctify our almighty and eternal God and bless this sacrifice, sacrifice prepared for thy holy name. And then the, the, the whopper is the, uh, is the last one. Receive, O Holy Trinity, this oblation, which we make to thee in remembrance of the passion, resurrection, and ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ, and in honor of the Blessed Mary, ever virgin, of Blessed John the Baptist, the Holy Apostles Peter and Paul, and of these, and then you mentioned the relics of the martyrs that are in the altar, which is another traditional thing, and of all the saints, that it may avail to their honor and our salvation, and that they may vouchsafe to intercede for us in heaven, whose memory we now keep on earth through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. All that taken out of the Mass in 1970. Our parish, and then way, he says, pray, higher. brethren, that our sacrifice, or that, yeah, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God Almighty. You hear that in the Novus Ordo. Just mention the relics. Our parish actually has an entire body skeleton of an early church martyr in the altar and it's got a glass so you can see in and see it who is it it's uh well it's saint we call our saint martura martyr oh, because martyr. they don't know the name but it was a body found in the catacombs of rome oh wow an early church martyr and this about 100 the church is like 175 years old about about 150 years ago or something they a, a pastor brought the body over from rome 
and it's in the it's actually in the altar and you can see it and when they don't have um, something coming right. of course you can actually see it so that really tells you you know the, the, the traditional idea of the relics in the altar that's that's very powerful <laughs> yeah 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 all the all we didn't mention that at the very beginning when the priest goes up the altar he prays and he kisses the altar and venerates the relics of the saint in the altar we forgot to mention that right but yeah these prayers though I mean just the word oblation, I don't mm-hmm. even think the average Catholic has heard that word in any sense, has any idea what it means. And I, right. I don't think the English translation has that word anywhere of the new mass. I don't, I don't think there's any use of no, that I term. So. I, so, I mean, just things like that. Uh, but you're right. The, these prayers are very powerful. They're very Catholic and they are offensive to Protestant ears. They can be, I mean, it depends on the Protestant, yes. um, but they can be offensive to Protestant ears because this is what the Protestants protested <laughs> right. were, were yeah. prayers like this. I mean, that's the whole point is they rejected the sacrificial character of the mass. They rejected these things and they should be, I mean, they not finished, but they should disagree. I mean, a Protestant yeah. who reads these prayers, if they're a faithful Protestant should say, this is all wrong. This is just completely not Christian, something like that. And so the idea that for some reason we want to make it palatable to them makes no sense to me. I mean, we're both former Protestants and I, I just feel like it's condescending as a Protestant. I would have felt like that. Yeah. That's just condescending to me. Like, don't try to, you know, you, we, we, we broke away from you people, you Catholics for a reason. Don't try to act like you're kind of like us now, either become right. Protestant or stay Catholic. And change you know? your liturgy to yeah. appease us. Yeah. I mean, that, yeah. I think that's condescending, frankly. It is very condescending. Um, and, you know, you, you mentioned in that previous video that, you know, we're not saying that the Novus Ordo is invalid right. or illicit, right? We believe Jesus is transubstantiated there. But more is more and less is less. And if you're not invoking a saint's name, like you mentioned earlier, John the Baptist, you're not invoking him. It's taken away. If you take out all of these majestic prayers and this invocation of the Holy Ghost down upon the oblation, if you take all that away, then you are taking it away. Right? It's not still mm-hmm. there. You have reduced the prayers, the the prayers of the saints, the prayers of the priests, the merits of the saints, everything that was being invoked here is goners, folks. So less is less. I, I mean, spiritual directors have always recommended that you spend an hour a day in, in meditative prayer. Well, you could spend five minutes a day and you are praying and that prayer is valid and it does have right. an impact. But would anybody say that's better than spending an hour a day in prayer? Right. And it's the same thing. And obviously there's stay of life. Yeah. Well, what if you not, said, uh, I'm going to do the new rosary and it's, mm-hmm. we, we just say the first half of the Hail Mary. Right. Is it just as good? Yeah, yeah, you're not asking for Our Lady's intercession at the hour of your death anymore. Yeah. Or what and if you just so, said, well, we're going to yeah. the new rosary is the same Hail Mary as before, but we say, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us. And we don't say, sinners now at the hour of our death. Is it as good? You removed something. And that's what happened here. They removed stuff. Right. So I just feel like there's, there's a difference. There, there's different debates. There's validity. And that's one thing. And, but then there's also... And objectively, the new mass is valid, obviously assuming the priest says it correctly and all that stuff. But there's a difference between the objective validity and the, the not, it's not just subjective, but the, the, the additional uh, graces that you receive and the, just the way, ob- and I think another thing, and that that's, should be obvious to people, obviously you pray to a saint and if you don't, there's a difference, but also how it impacts you when you hear these prayers and when you read these prayers and the, what you're asking for is different in a lot of cases, you're asking, you're, you're admitting you're a sinner more, you're begging for more mercy that impacts you subconsciously yeah. because it makes you realize you are a sinner. I mean, I think we'd all agree that if you, one of the crisis, one of the, the factors in the crisis of the, the modern Catholic church is the fact that people don't recognize that they're sinners that they, they really, you know, we're following this whole self-esteem uh, baloney right. where we think we're okay and we don't really need to beg for God for yeah, forgiveness. People need af- affirmation and accompaniment. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I love that last word. Not. Yeah. But in, if you go to the Latin mass and you're following the missile, 
you're reminded of your place in the world. In fact, I'm, I'm, there's a beautiful uh, devotional book, uh, Divine Intimacy. Yeah, I don't know if, good one. And, and it, it goes through the old, right? And the, literally yesterday's was, I think, like place in the world or something like that. And it's about humility. And I tell you what, if you really pray those prayers of the, uh, of the old mass, you really get a lesson in humility and you get, you're reminded of your place in the world and where it is and where it is not. Now, yes, you can still be prideful and sinful and stuff like that, but you at least are being told over and over again, certain things like where you, where you stack up, so to speak. And I think those are, those are ways that's almost a psychology of it. And that's the beauty of the, the, the liturgy, of these prayers, they, they encompass the whole human person. It's not just like, okay, we just got to ask God, you know, to, to make this bread into Jesus and that's it. There's a whole right. psychology there. Well, that, that reminds you who you are. So yeah. The, and you see this in these, in these prayers, of the offertory, obviously in the prayers for the altar everywhere throughout the mass. Right. I mean, the, what just st- stood out to me was when the priest says, uh, he offers the spotless host for my own countless sins, offenses, and negligences. Right. I mean, do we even think about that with our Lord? You know, that, yes, we sin, we offend him, but there's even things we're negligent on. Right. Just right. imperfections that aren't even yeah. sinful, but they're imperfections. And, yeah. our, and our Lord said, be perfect, because your Heavenly Father right. is perfect. And so even imperfections we should work on. Yep. So I think the offertory, even if you if, if you if you don't go to the Latin Mass, or maybe there's not one close to you, and you have the opportunity to to have a missile or read a missile, I would encourage you right away go to the offertory part and just read through those seven prayers, of the offertory, and and meditate on there. It's a good lesson in humility, but also that the Mass is a sacrifice. Right. The priest is getting ready; he's getting the bread ready. And he's getting the wine ready. It's not not transubstantiated yet. Still bread, still wine. But he's offering them and putting them into the sacred so that they will be ready to receive, to become the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. I've even heard it said, Eric, that let's just say that the priest finished the offertory and then he died. Like right there on the spot before he even got to lift up your hearts. Before he got to this is my body, this is my chalice of my blood. That the bread and the wine there, they wouldn't be the body and blood of Jesus Christ. But because of the old offertory, they would have been made hallowed and sacred. Wow. Right. They've been blessed and they've had the Holy Spirit called down upon right. them. I mean, he's prayed over them. I mean, this is no, it's it's now holy bread right. and holy wine. You couldn't right. just, you know. Right. Give it I mean, to something. Someone. Is holy. That means it's set aside. Yes, it's, it's right. separate, and so therefore, this bread and wine are now still bread and wine, but they're set aside. It's you holy bread, and holy wine, dinner. Yes. Yeah, like you'd have water and holy water. Now you have holy bread, holy wine. So at that point, but the old mass doesn't have this at all. The you priest never it. makes the bread and wine holy before he consecrates it. This is like yes. a pre step, right? So then he, the priest will say. Dominus Vobiscum, the Lord be with you and with your spirit. And then lift up your hearts, lift them to the Lord. All that is in Latin, of course. But if you're following the Missal, you'll immediately recognize it. And then he'll say the... Uh, that's basically the same as the new. Yeah, he says a preface, which is there's also, you would recognize the new. And then there's the, the Sanctus, 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 the Holy, Holy, Holy. And this leads right into the Roman canon, which never, there's no Eucharistic prayer, one, two, three, four, five, six B, yeah. whatever. There's yeah. just the one, the Roman canon they've been using since four or five hundreds. And you'll always right. see in missiles at this point, something really beautiful. There'll be a right. crucifixion. Um, this one, this is the uh, St. Andrews. It has a really nice, uh, it's Christ in the middle, God, the father, the Holy spirit and on an altar. For the Another thing at the Santus is that might be the first time um, I could be I could be mistaken here, but I think that's the first time in a lot of play, cases where you hear the bells. Yes, and you will always hear there will always be bells at, at even the low mass and high masses. There are always the bells are rung at, at various always. times, and so in the new mass, you know some some parishes will have bells to consecration or other times most do not, but you always have the bells rung. Uh, during a, a yeah. mass unless you're in you know the jungles of vietnam and there is no right. bell right right yeah but but basically if, if you can have a bell you you have bells rung and yeah. the santus i believe is the first time typically i know you mentioned it sometimes in another spot but i i think i remember 
I think our parish, we always do it at the Santus, but I could, I could yeah. be forgetting one of them. My son would yeah. know probably since he brings them often. Right. <laughs> I was, I was serving a Latin mass in a, uh, in a conference room. It was kind of a, you know, a trans transitory. It was a little small conference. Um, and we didn't have all the normal things you'd have in a church, right? The priest bought everything, but we didn't have the bell. So I just took a drinking glass and, and hit it with my wedding ring. I was serving and I just had a little, you know, and so we had a little bell. I mean, so even even if you're in a strange situation, you can always create a bell. And by the way, one of the reasons for the bell was in the old, in, in years, centuries ago, it was very common that the people would just simply, the congregation would simply pray and wouldn't really pay attention to what the priest was doing, or there could be a, a, a the what's it called the rude, um, you know, rude basically, screen. yeah, thank you, the rude screen. You wouldn't even actually see it. And so, for example, you always ring the bells at the elevation of the host after the consecration, and right. that was a way of saying, just so you, if you're not sure what's going on now, this is we need to worship. In fact, I was reading this great book about how Catholicism in England before the Reformation, before it was destroyed was it was typical that the main purpose people went to mass for was for the it was the adoration of the host at the, at the elevation it wasn't nobody very few people received communion and so that was the central part considered like the the, the central reason you went and so they right. rang the bell so everybody knew because you might not be able to follow along you might have the rude screen or whatever yeah. and so that's why they and so that's kind of why the bells are rung at various times because it's kind of telling everybody, okay, we're at this part now, you know, this is a very holy action being taken out. Obviously they're all holy in one sense, but this is, you know, the, the a high point of the liturgy, so to speak. Right. Right. Yeah. The Protestants hated all that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. And, and also it was, it was indulgence when the, when the host is lifted up, you know, and you see it, you say, you know, we teach the kids this, my Lord and my God, which is what St. Thomas said when he put his hands into the wounds of Jesus. And that was always an indulgence act. You would receive a partial indulgence. Traditionally, it was seven years and seven quarantines. So you get seven years and basically seven lengths of penance just by looking at the host and saying, my Lord and my God, recognizing wow. the miracle of transubstantiation, you got an indulgence wow. every single time. Great. So then the, the priest goes into the Roman canon and again, even if you, there's no way for you to attend a Latin mass, get a missile and just read through these incredible prayers and how they just continue to just lift the priest until he gets to that miracle of transubstantiation with the consecration. But it begins with the Te Igitur. We therefore humbly pray and beseech thee, O most merciful Father. There again, Eric is the mercy. Right. Right. It begins with a plea to God as the merciful father. And he says that thou would vouchsafe to receive and bless. And he says, these gifts, these offerings, these holy and unblemished sacrifices. It's beautiful. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it's so powerful. And you know, one of the, one of the things missing in the, the traditional Latin mass is there's no prayers of the faithful. And I say, thanks yeah. be to God, because I don't want to hear about all these politically correct yeah. agenda items or, that the people of our parish will be general, generous with the bishop's capital campaign this yeah. year. We pray to the Lord. All this kind of passive aggressive subtext yeah, my, stuff that goes on. Peeve, yeah, my pet peeve is also where the, the passive aggressive, those are just driving me crazy. But yeah. my pet peeve is when they say, We pray for Bishop so and so that he will continue to be the most awesomest bishop on earth. Yeah. I mean, it's like, <laughs> right. it's yeah. like what, I mean, what's the difference between that and this, you know, pray that we're we, on these right. unworthy servants, we beg the Almighty God to forgive us. Between the difference between those two is, is very stark, yeah. but that's what you hear so often. And yeah. it's like, oh, it drives me crazy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so there's so there's so much. And then, you know, you know, whenever the, in Texas, if it has to do with um, legislation that's going through regarding immigration and search, all of a sudden, you know, like the pastor's favorite political uh, positions are in the prayers of the faithful, you know. Um, I've so, had many anyhow. times where I've not said, Lord, hear our prayer. Yeah. Yeah. I deal with like, no, I'm not so the good thing is most of the general intentions that we need to hit, which is praying for the Pope, it's in the Roman canon. Praying for your bishop, it's in the Roman canon. Praying for the dead, right. it's in the Roman canon. Praying for the universal church, it's in the canon. So, 
you know, including invocation of there's two two invocations of a list of saints, Roman saints, which is very powerful. In the Novus Ordo, you can say Eucharistic Prayer One, which is Roman canon, but you can omit the saints. It's an option; they're bracketed. That's a bad idea. More is more, less is less. Um, and then I guess you know we should probably say a little bit more about the consecration. So there'll be a triple bell for the for the body and a triple bell for the blood. So the first bell, the priest will genuflect. He worships the Eucharist, and then he raises it right over his head. And then he kneels again, and there's a bell. So it's bell. Right. Actually, it's bell, 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 Tri- bell. Yeah, bell. bell, triple bell, then bell. Yeah. And what I often do is, and people can pray, like the, saying my Lord, my God is always a great one. What I, what I often do is on each of the three bells, I will say something like uh, to myself, obviously, uh, like I praise you, I love you, I worship you. And then I'll say my Lord and my God. It yeah. just, it's just something for me because, and I do mm-hmm. it also with the chalice because it has a triple bell as well. I'll say, I praise you. I worship you. I love you. Just to, right. as, a, as a personal devotion, you can do something like that. But, right. And we and, say it silently. Of course. Yeah. yeah. Saying, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Make sure it's clear. Do not. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Um, mm. But yes. And I think in, in the, the bell at the, uh, after the three bells, the last bell is when the, the priest will genuflect after he's placed the, uh, right. the host or the, or the chalice down, he will then genuflect. So. Um, that's the most bells are right there. Yeah, you said bell, triple bell, then bell. Yeah. And, and then usually with, because of that, you know how in, in the notice order, the length of time the priest holds the host up depends on the priest. You get the, you know, like that where he's waving, and then you get some that hold it very long. And then some that do the spray coming. where they go. Right. This it, is like my those, uh, body. <laughs> yeah, he needs a spinning chair. Um, right. But, it, with this, basically, the priest knows to hold it for the time of the triple bell because it's not running real quickly. A, a good right. server will ring it once, a little bit of pause, a twice, pause, third time, and yeah. the, and so you have an opportunity to adore the Lord. I mean, that's what right. that's the reason it's being held up to adore it. Yeah. Um, and so the the, the the quickie move doesn't happen in the old mass because yeah. they have to do it in sync with the bells, and so yeah. that that's why it's held up for a little bit longer. Have you ever seen it uh, where the where the server will also sense? Yes, and so yeah. do it uh, in conjunction with the bells. They will they will sense it as well, and that's beautiful because just the the picture of it is you know the, the the host is being held up. You have all these people, all these men or boys kneeling around him with the priest, the only one standing. The and then you have the incense, so you have the the the, the smoke kind of rising up. You have the bell. I mean, it's just like it, it's. One of the most beautiful scenes on, it probably is the most beautiful scene on yeah. earth you can ever see. And it's just because everything is, every eye, everything is focused, every action is focused on Jesus Christ, who is yeah. literally now here. And it just, it, it's, it's such it, a It still thing. startles me in a good way because remember, folks, everything the priest is saying right now is whispered. Right. You don't hear any of it. So it's, if you're at a low mass, it is completely silent except for babies crying in the church. Completely silent. If it's a solemn high mass, the choir is singing the Sanctus. And usually it changes in certain places. They'll stop. And then after the consecration, they'll pick up the Benedictus. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord because he just came. So you'll see that too. But it's quiet. And then all of a sudden the quiet gets pierced with that bell and you look up and there's Jesus. It's very dramatic. It's one of, you know, people always say, oh, the Eastern liturgy is so much better than the Western liturgy. I disagree. I think that that moment with the silence and then the bell and the elevation and the Roman rite is just, I mean, talk about nailing it. Yeah, it really is. And, and uh, in a more practical Lord. sense, let's be honest, during the silent part, your mind can wander and you can, right. and I, I, that happens to me where maybe a kid distracts you or whatever, or maybe you're just thinking about, oh, I got to do this later today. I got to, you know, I got a tree fall down in my yard. I got to cut it up, whatever the case may be. And all of a sudden that bell rings and it's like, it jars you like, okay, wait a minute, where am I? Let me focus again. And it helps you really focus back on why you're there. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. And, you know, this is kind of a controversial thing too, Eric, is I will, people, I've said on videos, I pray the rosary during the mass. And that's, people are pulling their hair out. They can't, believe, Taylor Marshall, pray the rosary during the mass. What the, What's wrong with you? And if you're in a Novus Ordo context, that doesn't make much sense. Yeah. yeah. But in a low mass, especially, the offertory is quiet. You see the priest preparing the chalice and washing his hands, but it's all quiet. 
And then the canon, other than the bells and the consecration, the elevation is quiet as well. And so I will pull those beads out, usually at the operatory. And uh, I will begin, usually I, I, depends on what mysteries or what I've prayed already or what I'm going to pray, but almost always I will start the sorrowful mysteries. And to me, it's just appropriate to call my blessed mother to help me to pray through the Hail Marys and to meditate on agony in the garden, right? Take this chalice for me. And the priest is preparing the chalice on, on the altar and, you know, scourging at the pillar. Sometimes I even think of our Lord, like standing on the altar, bloody or being scourged, you know, as the priest is preparing and then crowning of thorn. And so I'm meditating on these scenes from the gospel through the rosaries. To me, it fits perfectly. I, I love it. I think it's a great devotion. But for some people, they just yeah. can't believe that I do this. Man, are you offensive to Protestants. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but the truth is, in the new mass, it is inappropriate because you're not doing what you're supposed to do. You're supposed right. to be responding. You're supposed to be doing these things, and you're not doing them. In the old mass, you're not supposed to be doing anything other than being there and, right. and praying. And so if you want to pray, if that helps you, praying the rosary helps you to enter into the mysteries more deeply, then go for it. I mean, that's great. It's not a requirement, right. but it's, it's a great thing. If that's what helps you recognize the sacrificial nature of what's going on, things like that, it's great. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a place there where you can... You know, you can pray whatever you want. I mean, you should be praying. You shouldn't just be there picking right. at your fingernails. I mean, you right. should, your soul should be actively participating yeah. and your mouth should not be moving or saying well, anything. Like so said, what like are you going to do? Said, rosary is a perfect fit. Yeah. yeah, it's like I just said how you know, the mind can get distracted. Well, the rosary is a great thing. If you find that every time you go to mass, that silent part, you are thinking about what you're going to have for lunch later or whatever the case may be, then perhaps you need some type of aid because we're human. That happens to all of right. us. You need some type of aid to help uh, get your focus where it should be. Yeah, especially at the low mass at this point. Right. And also with kids, uh, it's very common to bring picture books and kid missiles. There's a whole, I mean, there's all kinds of things because right. kids also are going to need some help not to, you know, lose their attention and, and think about other things and start fighting with their little brother in the pew. And so, you know, we bring rosaries for the kids. We bring little picture books. These are times when they, too, can, you know, focus on our Lord in a kid way. You know, maybe there's a, a picture book that has the passion of Christ in it for kids. It's a great time for them to work through that book at that time. And really, the, the Latin Mass demands more of us in the sense of how we participate. It, people might think the opposite because you do more in the in the new Mass, but really what you're doing is you're just kind of saying things like the server would have said in the old days or something like that. But in the new mass, you're, I mean, sorry, in the old mass, you're really supposed to be focused on what's going on. And so you're asked to do more. You're, you're more mature in a sense because they're asked. So a kid needs to be trained on how to do that, that they're not going to tell you what to do. You don't just have these responses to say all the time. You need to recognize what's going on and hear some helps. Like we have the picture books as well and they're great. But I also think it helps them because you see at the new mass, sometimes these parents, when they bring their kids, they have literally a whole playground with them of stuff. And it's like, <laughs> well, what are you doing? This isn't like, you know, playtime. I mean, I, I totally get getting things right. to distract kids. I have young kids. I've had young kids for many years. And we do exactly what you say. I usually bring picture books of a missile picture book or like a Bible picture book, something like right. that. And I tell them you can look at this and, you know, and it may have a rosary with them that they not one that they can swing around and kill people with, but um, <laughs> depending on their age. So oh, the things that happen at mass. With yeah. Kids. yeah. Yeah. And, and also people realize that Taylor Marshall, Eric Simmons, we're at mass. There's probably people watching who have seen me and my family mass. Like, oh, brother, the marshals. It's, it's not just these, you know, people elevating off the floor in ecstasy. You yeah. will see crying kids. You will see a mom disciplining her 11 year old son. You will see parents at the, the bells are ringing at the elevation and parents are ribbing their kids. Like, look, look, it's Jesus. You will yeah. see all of this stuff going on. It's a pretty dynamic situation. I and oh, another thing is you will be going in and out with your kids all the time. And that's yes. okay. It's actually yeah. to me kind of a, it's easier in the Latin mass to go in and out a lot because the priest is sort of right. holding things down. Right. Yeah. Right. It's you not so much about what I'm bringing right. to the table. Um, and so, you know, you, you go out with, you know, if your kid's crying, you take them out. If your kid's laughing kid, I, a whole lot or talking a lot, you take them out. And it's not like a punishment. It's just, right. hey, let's get them settled down. And I sometimes, yeah. 
sometimes you just I tell my wife this week if the kids are and we have babies or whatever. Which one do you want this week? The sermon or the consecration? We each got to <laughs> right. get, you know, like, I'll take consecration this week. You take the sermon. Okay. Right. Exactly. And that's the way to do it. And there's no, I mean, I had literally had one of my daughters, I was taking her on mass and she screamed at the top of her lungs, don't spank me, daddy. Cause she, <laughs> cause she had been naughty in mass. She'd been like right. doing something she wasn't, she yeah. knew she wasn't supposed to. She was old enough to get spanked and she's screaming at the top of her lungs in mass. And I'm just like mortified. She's a beautiful Catholic young woman. Now she's an adult now and she's beautiful. Right. And so never feel bad about taking your kids out or them screaming yeah. or acting up. Kids are kids and they learn. Yeah. I saw what we're talking about. There's a funny one about a month ago. So at the back of the church at a hall, at a, at, it, it, there's for a high mass, there's a bell with a rope on it. And at the back of the church, they'll ring that when the clergy come in to process. Right. So it was about five till. And usually you'll see the priests and the servers and the thoroughfare and the crucifer. Everybody's lined up at the back of the church. And when everybody's set, they ring the bell. They weren't even there yet. It was like four minutes till. And this dad is standing by the back door. And the three-year-old reaches out and pulls the bell. And immediately everybody stands up and the choir started. Oh, that's great. Yeah. And, but, but there's no procession. And then I think an usher ran out and like told the priest like, y'all come on, come on. Cause everybody was going. And I mean, these things, these things, this is human. And we're talking about hundreds of people, families, and you will never see as many little kids and babies than you will at the Latin mass. It's a pretty noisy situation. Right. Well, so, how silent it is, it's noisy at the same time. Yeah, <laughs> silent exactly. up at the altar and you got activity going on in yeah. the congregation so just because. If you're watching this, like, I don't know, I have four or five kids. Don't worry about it. I've had Bring people them. who tell me they didn't. I invite them to my uh, Latin Mass Parish and with, that I go to and I've and they have young kids and they have not gone simply because they're, they don't want to, they're afraid that the kids are going to act all of a sudden. And then people, I'm like, you don't understand. Just come and trust me. If you have right. to come one time by yourself without your kids and just so you can see it and you'll know, okay, wow, my kids aren't that bad after all. <laughs> right. Right. Okay. So that all happens. Um, there will be another bell at the end when the priest does the through him with him in him. He'll elevate the chalice with the host. There'll be a bell. Then there's the Our Father in Latin. And this kind of throws people for a loop because you, we don't say it. Right. Only the priest says the Pater Noster. Uh, in a, in a uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. A lot we of parishes I've been to, they do say it. A Latin mass parishes I've been to. Really? Yeah, yeah, I've been a lot of places where the congregation, I'm not talking about low mass, low mass, not never there, but I've been um, where the, the whole congregation says it um, before, yeah. but typically. Yeah, it, that's like a 1965 blended thing they started yeah, doing. Yeah. I've yeah. never seen that. Yeah. I've never seen that. Interesting. Okay. Well, usually, though, you're right. You, you, we don't say we, and we don't hold hands. That's the other thing. No, we do not hold hands. <laughs> if you grab my up, hand, don't. I'm pulling it away. <laughs> right, exactly. People are gonna that you would you would get some uh, frowns if you if you tried to hold someone's hand I've during. People give me the evil eye, the stink eye at the new yeah. mask because I don't hold hands, and they'll just be like, "What are you right. selling? Too good for us." So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then there's the passing of the peace, right? Which is quite different. So the priest will break the host and he'll take a particle of it, a piece of it. And over the chalice three times, he'll say the peace of the Lord be always with you. And then he'll drop it. And this is signifying the Christ symbolically died when the body and the blood are separated. If I took Eric's blood out of his body, he would be dead if I separated him. When you bring it back together, it signifies the resurrection. And the very first thing Jesus said on the day of his resurrection, the apostles was the peace of the Lord be always with you. So since that's the words of the resurrection, this is the bringing together of the body and blood. It signifies mystically the resurrection of Christ. And in a solemn high mass, the priest will then pass the holy kiss, not the shaking of the hand, but you'll see them grab each other's elbows and they'll kind of, they don't actually, I've never actually right. seen that. Have you ever seen yeah. that? I, I, I hope they're not doing too much. Of yeah, that, I've never yeah. seen an actual because in the old days they greeted each other with a holy kiss. You see Paul write that in the New Testament. Right. So they'll they'll sort of embrace each other and come in right. like that, and then the deacon will go and do that with the subdeacon. So the peace kind of trickles down from the altar. And also, right. subdeacon will do it with the master, the MC as well. I've seen that. Right, and um, then I've also seen in a monastic setting 
where then that, I don't know if it's the MC or the subdeacon passes it to the monks. I think I saw this maybe at Clear Creek and they all pass the peace. Right. But the important thing is there is no sign of peace for the congregation. You're not shaking hands with anybody. You don't have those awkward times where you have to turn around and all that stuff. It's just, right. it's, it's the, the, the and then everybody says, happening. Oh, you have a beautiful it's, family or right. welcome to the parish. Chatting. Right. Exactly. So no, none of that. So, which again, I think we brought this up at the last in our 10 reasons to attend introverts can feel much more comfortable at the, at the old mass. You it's, don't have to, because honestly it's a, it's a yeah. challenge for introverts to go to the new mass sometimes when they're all glad, yeah. happy about everything. Right. You don't want to be like talking to you. You're there to worship God. You're not there to hang out. You can yeah, do that the, afterwards. Jesus is on the altar. Just the consecration just happened. Right. Why are we turning around talking to each other? Right. Doesn't make any sense. All right. Then we got the Agnes day lamb of God. This will be sung by the choir. Right. If yeah. it's a high mass, if it's a low right. mass, the priest will just say it. Then the priest has a, a bunch of prayers to prepare himself for receiving the for Holy Communion. Yeah. When and then you usually all, go there and you know the Our Father just happened, you think you're about to go up for communion immediately because that's basically what happens. You know, one sign piece, you're, you're up for communion almost immediately. But the, there's this, I, that took that threw me off a little bit. There's a there's a mm-hmm. decent break there because the priest has a lot more prayers to say. Yeah, he says his prayers, and then, then the servers or the deacon and the subdeacon will say the confidior again. Now, some I have been to places where this is not. This is called. Some people call it the second confidior. Some people call it the third confidior. Because remember, at the beginning, the priest of the confidior and the servers of the confidior, and here it is repeated again. Why is it repeated? Because you may have sinned or had a negligence during mass. Wow. Right. And now yeah. you're going to receive communion. So it's said again. And again, do they do it at your parish? Yeah. Yes. You say it again. Yeah. yeah. Everywhere yeah. I've been. I've all, I, I know that some places don't, but I've never been to a parish where they didn't. Say yeah, I've, I've seen it rarely where they omitted this. And again, this was sort of in 1965 in the transitional right before the Novus Ordo, I believe that was also taken out here. And I think that's why you see a discrepancy. No, I noticed yesterday at the Solemn High Mass I went to, the deacon actually sang it, the confidior, I think. So it's in, so uh, we have a new pastor at our parish and I don't, I mean, again, it's, it's hard for me to remember all this stuff, but I don't ever remember it being chanted, the confidior, and it, it has been. Right. I, yeah, I wasn't, I, that's the first time I remembered that happening was, uh, yeah. was uh, the deacon singing, actually chanting the confitio at this point. And yes. I was a little yeah, bit. Yeah, they do it at our parish too. Okay. I like it. I think it's cool. Yeah, it is. And then um, the the priest will turn around, he'll hold the host over the chalice and he'll say, Eche Agnes Dei, Eche Quitoli Peccata Mundi, right? Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. At a low mass, you won't say anything. The server will say, Lord, I am not worthy. Right. But and this is a thing that I've seen different in different places at our parish during a, a Misa Cantata or Solemn High Mass. The congregation will recite right. Domin on Sum Dignus and Interest of Right. That's in my experience, in, too. Yeah. In Latin. Yeah. Right. And you all recite it three times. And you strike the, pre- the breast. Right. This is Lord, I'm not worthy that thou should come under my roof, but speak the word only. My soul shall be healed. And then people will receive communion. And it's always at the rail. Don't put your hands here because they're going to put a right. golden plate right. to catch the host in case of mistakes made. So don't don't ever be like this. Keep your hands down. You will not say amen when he tells you it's the body of Christ. He's not going to say corpus Christi. He's going to say, it's quite a bit longer, corpus domini nostri, Jesus Christi, custodia anima, anima. Animum tuum in vitam eternum. May the body of our Lord Jesus Christ preserve your soul to life everlasting. Amen. All you do is stick out your tongue. And you stick it out as far and as gross as you think you can do it. You stick the tongue out. And think of a helicopter trying to land on a small pad. The bigger you can make that pad, there's going to be no chance that he touches your tongue with his finger. And you don't move your head at all. Because a lot of times what happens is, especially kid, they'll kind of go like trying to help. You're hurting. No. You just want that. You want that priest to not have to worry about that, that, that landing pad, so to speak, moving. Yeah, he's doing he hundreds of landing pads. Right. 
right fast. He's just going through and so you just don't move you and i usually tell my kids to look up like with their they should be kind of looking up at the priest's head they can have their eyes closed or whatever yeah. But that just kind of makes it so it's easier because sometimes my kids, they have a tendency to kind of be down like this. And so yeah. even if they go like this, it's like, it's hard. That's to, still good. You know? Yeah. yeah you so want jaw them. up, tongue out, mouth open wide. Right. If you're doing a, like a slot machine like this. Yeah. He's going to have to yeah. touch your lips to get it in there. It's gross, guys. Don't do that. He doesn't want to do that. And more importantly, there's a better chance of, of it falling. Of it, it, it right. not. And, and they have the patent there, but... You know, even you just don't want that to happen. Uh, you want you to prevent that. Yeah. I've had, I mean, I've been at traditional masses where the, the host has fallen on the ground. And here's, this is interesting. When this happens, they stop immediately. I've had this at Latin mass a couple times, actually, where the, the host fell onto the floor for whatever reason. And immediately he stops giving communion. Immediately he goes up and he, he has to do all the things he needs to do to pick up the host to wash off the area to, to do everything. I don't even know everything he does to be honest, but it's like, everybody just has to wait now. And it might be five or 10 minutes because yeah. he wants to make sure there could be a particle of our Lord, uh, you know, uh, our Lord down there. Uh, I'm sorry, a particle, which is our Lord right. on the floor. And we could not, we don't want anybody moving or doing anything because they could Stepping step on, on it. it. It could, yeah. the wind could blow it or something. I mean, who knows what would happen? Um, so just let's try to keep that from happening <laughs> by, right. by doing it. And the patent's there because for that very reason, sometimes it bounces off. Sometimes, you know, whatever the servers may be a little lazy. I know our priest, if a server gets lazy, they get on them. Like, oh, no, yeah. that patent needs to be there every single time. Right. Don't, don't kind of go halfway or anything like that. Um, so, but and always just make sure it's clear. You always receive on the tongue, never in the hand at yeah. the Latin mass. So if you hold your hands out, they will go over you. They will not give you communion that you won't receive. And it. if you're not receiving communion, you don't have to go up. It's very common. in Correct. A new mass. Most people receive, but they kind of cross their arms, stuff like that. You don't have to do that. Just stay in your pew is fine. Yep. If you do go up for some reason, I don't know, cross your arm, put your head down or something, but it'd probably be better just not. But to go you're up. not going to get a blessing. Right. Right. You're not going to get a blessing. Exactly. So don't, just, there's really no reason to go. I mean, we bring our younger kids who aren't communicants up just so they're not, swinging yeah. rosaries in the back of the church without I us. Do the same thing. And I tell, yeah. and our pastor knows who they are, but even if they don't, I always tell them cross your arms, kind of keep your head down that way. They know for sure. But and if the priest doesn't priest, know, right? sometimes yeah. like our seven year old who hasn't received yet, right. the, you'll get a little look from the priest's face. Yeah, and just kind right. of go. yeah, that's exactly right. That's what I do. Yeah. I have a seven year old who's going to receive next year. So she looks old enough that a priest doesn't yep. know her might yep. think. And I just give the, the little shake. Yeah. No. So they know. So close your eyes, because if your eyes are open, you okay. you are going to naturally want to follow the movement of his hand, right. and you've just created a moving target, which right. is much harder to hit. Look, jaw up, mouth open. Why well, I'm not going to do it on camera because it's gross. Mouth <laughs> open as wide as you can, tongue out. I mean, I've heard priests say this. Open your mouth as big as you can, stick your tongue out as far as possible. That's right. what I, that's my ideal communicant right there, because I can... I can go down the line fast. I don't have to think about it. Okay, I got to get low. I got to, if they're all like that, he can just come down like a typewriter and, and communicate everyone efficiently and safely, right? right. You, it's, it's quick, but the most important thing is, is that the host goes on the tongue and stays on the tongue and right. doesn't fall off onto the patent or worse. And the there's ground. like a split second after he places it on there before you kind of bring your tongue in because his hand might still be there. I mean, a very short, uh, you know, you just don't want to bring it in before you know it's there, but it'll stick right. there because it's your tongue and everything. Yeah. The other thing is after you've received, don't stay at the, at the altar well for the next 10 minutes making your, your personal <laughs> prayers. Even if <laughs> you're about to go into ecstasy, you, you need to right, stay exactly. up. <laughs> if you're saying yeah. Catherine of Siena will give you a break. Otherwise, right. Just get up. You can make a sign of the cross. Make sure he's past you if you're going to make a sign of the cross because you don't want to hit the patent or him or anything like that. Yeah. But once he gets to the next person, you can make a sign of the cross and you get up and go and make all your prayers in the pew. In the pew. Because there's other people coming and you you, you just clog yeah. up the works if you if you stay yeah. up there. And it's not it doesn't more, make you look more pious, by the way. <laughs> one more hint is I've noticed, um, I don't know why this is, but when you go into the onto the communion, you want to get as not tight where you're like, rubbing up against person, but you want to get in there. I've noticed some people will take like a whole body length between them and the next person. And I'm just thinking to myself, that's just, if everybody did that communion, it would take twice as long. 
So, so you want to ministers, and that's an no. thing. It's always some. A lot of times, you will have a second priest will come out if the parish has multiple priests. The second priest will come out and do one half or something like that. But it's never more than that, and so therefore, it's going to take a little longer, which is fine. Than than uh, the same parish with fifteen, you know, an army of Eucharistic ministers, but you can speed that up by just like, like Taylor said, don't you, you should be basically shoulder to shoulder. I mean, you don't have to touch right. the person, but you have to be just be like, right yeah, like this, but right. you know, you should, you should, there shouldn't be space between people really just get it, get everybody, get everybody in there. All right. And then you go back to your pew and this is a really important time in the Latin mass. This is where you make your Thanksgiving. And I always tell my kids, you know, you don't come back to the pew and just sit there, kneel and look off into space. Jesus is in you. You just, this is the most important thing. And this is a time in the red book. There's a whole bunch of prayers. Oh, there you go. Um, there's a great yeah, one in there. Has them. Yeah. And there's a, there's a great one in there by Thomas Aquinas to say okay. after you receive Holy Communion. I almost always try to say that one. Um, sometimes if kids are bad, I'm in the back of the church holding a kid or watching a kid. I don't have a missile to start praying a bunch of prayers. I don't have the red booklet. Guess what I pull out? The rosary. Because that's what I got. I got one hand free. The rosary is a great little tool. And that for me to to get in touch and to, to with our Lord and to thank him and to have something that I'm not distracted with. So, again, this you're not going to get any announcements at this point. No one's going to get up and give a, a talk about how you need to give money or volunteer for the youth group. This is silence and a time for you to be really close with our Lord, the Savior. I mean, you're praying to our Lord who is inside you. I mean, that's a, yeah. you can't I mean, get more intimate. We literally can't get more intimate with our Lord than that. You know, on yeah, this I mean, earth. that's a personal relationship with Jesus right there. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, and so then the the priest and the deacon and the subdeacon will, will do the ablutions. You'll see them up at the altar, uh, purifying the chalice and getting everything um, making sure that there's nothing, no crumbs or no droplets um, of our Lord's precious body and blood left over or abused. And then there's, he'll pray the post-communion verse mm-hmm. and the blessing. Which, which you genuinely reflect for or right. kneel, I should say. Uh, that's one actually, thing. actually the, he does the Ita Misa Est first. Right. That Deo is gratias. confusing because it's the other way around in the new mass, right? That's right. Yes. Yeah. He, I always, I, I, for a long time, I'd be like, wait a minute, which comes first? And I forgot that they're actually right. different. But yeah, yeah. He'll do, so the mass is ended. Then he'll give the blessing, which makes more sense, frankly. Right. And then, uh, but the, the, it's common. Most, most people, they will uh, kneel during the, 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 um, That's correct. the blessing. So. And then. You think it's over, but then there's this this thing called the last gospel that everybody. Yeah, but there's more. And you you stand up and he will announce the continuation from the Holy God or the beginning, not the continuation, the beginning of the gospel of St. John. And he'll read those first. What is it? 17 verses or so? 17. 14. 14 14. verses. Um, And when he gets to and the word was made flesh and you'll hear him at verbum caro factum est. You briefly genuflect. You don't stay down long. It's just kind of a yeah. up and down, right? The world was made flesh and dwelt among us. And then at the end of that, the server will say, Deo gratias. The mass is over at that point. Now, if it's a solemn high mass or a sung mass, there'll be a procession out, right? If it's a low mass, he and the servers will immediately go to the foot of the altar and they will pray the Leonine prayers. And these were originally... Um, instituted by Pius IX for the preservation of the papal states in Rome as the capital. And then Leo added the St. Michael prayer. And then Pius XI changed it for prayers for Russia and the errors of Russia. And then in Vatican II, they got rid of them. All right. They were abolished during the Second Vatican Council. But they're great. I mean, it's three Hail Marys. It's and we the, all and everybody prays this together. So, like normally, just like you know, the priest will say the beginning. Yeah, you usually don't the congregation, leave. Right, and the congregation. My, my point is, is like this actually is a dialogue, whatever you want to call it. Oh, right. Where the congregation actually will pray that they're in English, and we all pray together. So, like you know, he'll say the first part, Hail Mary. Then the whole congregation will say the second part. Right. It's like about the only yeah, time so you, you actually interact. Yeah, with it'll them. be loud. You'll hear it. And it'll be in right. English. Right. It'll be in English. I think I've maybe seen it once in Latin, but. 
this is almost always in English. At a parish, it'll be in, in English. If you're in England, I think you have parish for the Queen there too, or something like that. I think that's correct. Yeah. yeah. So it'll be three Hail Marys, Hail Holy Queen, uh, then a prayer that the priest alone will say, Oh God, our refuge and our strength. And then the St. Michael prayer, St. Michael, the archangel, defend us in battle. And then Pius X added, most sacred heart of Jesus, have mercy on us three times. Okay. At that point, you can, if you want, genuflect and leave, or you can stay in the pew and pray, whatever. But at that point, you start seeing people grabbing their coats, grabbing their hats, right. heading for the doors. Yeah. And also, typically, people have, I've had people ask, how long does it last? Typically, a low mass I've seen will last maybe 40, 45 minutes, depending on the homily. It can go up to an hour if it's a long homily. I've I'm seen them at 30. Mass. I've seen them at yeah. 30. You can get them in even faster, but typically yeah. a, a normal one is around 40. A, a sung mass and even a solemn high mass, they're not that much different in how long they are. And I typically an hour 15 to an hour and a half. I don't know if I've ever been to a sung mass that only lasted an hour. Uh, which is kind of the common thing for a new mass. Usually it bleeds into an hour 15 because of more prayers and more actions and things like that. Right. But I don't, I, I don't usually well, time them, but I did time the solemn high mass a few Sundays ago. It might've been like Septuagesima or one of those Sundays, but it was a solemn high deacon and subdeacon. And it was one twenty five when they professed or processed out the back door. And that's usually so, usually within an hour and a half, unless it's some. I mean, Novus Ordo yeah. with all the announcements at the end, you're at a you're at an hour and nine minutes. You know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so just know it's typically a little bit longer. Uh, you're, it will be a little yeah. bit longer, and the priests know that, so they schedule the masses yeah. accordingly. Yeah, if it's a low mass and he he doesn't do a sermon or a homily, uh, and he he has a good uh, a good pace to him, it could be a half an hour. I've I've done half an hour. In fact, this is a great fun fact. Pope St. Pius X, when he was going through his canonization process, there used to be this thing called the devil's advocate, where there, there'd be a theologian or a scholar who actually his job was to prove that you weren't a saint, right? And the devil's advocate for Pius X, when he was going through the process, found two problems with Pius X. One was he smoked a cigarette once a day. And the other is sometimes people observe that his low mass was 25 minutes long. <laughs> so those are the things brought against St. Pius X against his yeah. canonization is a cigarette and a 25 minute mass. So okay, Pius X so could say a 25 minute mass. So you can, you can, you yeah. will see a 30 minute mass occasionally, right. but yeah, I would say your normal daily mass with a short homily is going to be about 40 minutes. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And on Sunday, because of how long, much longer it takes to communicate everybody, they're usually a low mass is usually it's still an hour. Yeah, it's about yeah. sometimes it'll be 55 minutes, but it's usually right. right at an hour. Right. So when my kids are like, high mass is so much longer. I'm like, it's really only about 20 minutes longer. Yeah, it's not that big a difference. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, there it is. Great. I mean, we went through the whole thing. Yeah. Eric. And um, I would say, you know. Hopefully watching this, you realize it's it's doable. Hopefully, if you are going, you, you kind of maybe learn a few other things, but just go. Right. That's the biggest advice. Just go. Just, just sit go. in the pew if you have to. Heck, even if you have to just, if you feel most comfortable sitting in the back pew and never moving, just sitting the whole time, I mean, you should kneel right. during the consecration, obviously, in those times. But even just show up if that's what you want to do. Because I think you'll, once you start going, you'll realize the beauty of it and, and, and the power of it. Yeah. The ideal would be, again, just to reiterate, a solemn high mass on a Sunday. Right. I would say the least ideal would be a low mass on a weekday. Right. Because it's going to be a sparse crowd and it's going to be the low mass. It's, it's going to be harder to do. So I wouldn't say, yeah. oh, I'll go my first one on Thursday at 7 a.m. Right. It's going to be hard. There might not be very many people in the congregation. Yeah, you, and yeah it might so, be five people. And so you you might yeah. be complete. And if that is the case and that's all you got, just yeah. sit in the back and, go, yeah. and, and yeah. watch and kneel when you can and follow the nobody's red book or whatever you can. You. Yeah, nobody's yeah. going to bother you about that. They're, they're going to be fine right. if you're doing that. So. But if you, if you go on a Sunday and there's 300 people there or 500 people and it's a solemn high mass and you sit midway up in the pews, right. you're going you to disappear. You're going you're gonna to be fine. You're going to disappear. Yeah, absolutely. So, all right, well, let's, uh, let's close with the prayer. I want to pray a Hail Mary for everybody who watches this video. And, and awesome. um, I really just, my goal, and I know you feel the same way, Eric, is for the old evangelization to take root. I would encourage, right. whoops, 
Uh, I'd encourage everybody to um, check out Eric's book, Old Evangelization. And a part of that is liturgical. And so I'm just, I'm excited. There's so many people who are trying out the Latin Mass in 2019. They see all these problems in the church and they said, well, you know, we need some sanity. We need something that's regular and that's reverent and that's wholesome. And the Latin Mass provides that for so many people. So I hope this year people attending the Latin Mass doubles, triples, you know, new vocations, everything. So I would say Hail Mary. I'll say the first half. You'll say the second half. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now at the hour of our death. Amen. Amen. St. Joseph, pray Pray for for us. us. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for watching. Check out Eric's book, um, The Old Evangelization, and um, like and subscribe to this channel. Pray your rosary every day, and check out the Latin Mass. Till next time, God bless.